how to build an Alpha Legion army. We will cover off on four main areas. Firstly, how the box set enables each Legion. Secondly, how the Legion's special rules can be taken advantage of on the table. Thirdly, how rights of war impact unit selection. And lastly, whether any Legion Warlord traits change the way you might build and play your army. So, first up, the box set. It's a bit of a mixed bag with how useful the box set is for the Alpha Legion. Alpha Legion have a lot of uses for Marines, in particular tactical squads or veteran squads with Bane Strike Bolters are a lot of fun and super scary for an opponent, even if they are potentially overpriced. Uh, the denial range they encourage is probably enough to justify their points. You want to take these smaller squads that get the best advantage out of Power Daggers and Venom Spear upgrades, that seems, that seems pretty optimal. Both tactical and heavy support squads will be useful in pretty much any Alpha Legion build, so you'll definitely use those beakies that you get in the box set. Whether you need 10 Cataphracti Terminators or not in an Alpha Legion army comes down to the Rite of War you pick. If you go down the coils of the Hydra Rite of War, you can definitely re-roll the box set Terminators. You just won't have the elite slots for them, let alone the points. The Headhunter Leviathan Rite of War certainly has more use for them, but if I had to choose and was ready to drop some cash, I'm probably going to take a beefy unit of Lernian, t Lernian Terminators because the models are spectacular, even if they are hard to pronounce. Keep in mind that if you're taking Alpharius, you probably don't need a Spartan either. Uh, Alpharius can pass out Infiltrate or Deep Strike uh, to himself and three other units at the start of the game. So getting that, uh, needing that transport is less of a concern. With that covered, Let's have a chat about the Alpha Legion Special Rule. The Alpha Legion Special Rule lies and obfuscation and what army build that will support. Let's see, the rule itself reads, a model with this special rule is always considered to be two inches further away than it actually is when measuring range to it from any enemy model for the purpose of resolving a shooting attack, charge, or any reaction declared by an enemy model or unit. This is cumulative with any other modifiers to range imposed by special rules, such as night fighting or war gear. Now, I believe that special rule encourages range shooting and a counter-assault counter style army. Uh, just to clarify, if that wording is confusing, and I don't think it is. I think this is one of GW's better rules that they've written and that we've seen, because some of them are so wordy. This one's pretty simple. Uh, the enemy just has to add two inches to what they're trying to achieve for shooting attacks, charges, and reaction. So if they'd normally need a eight inch charge, for instance, which is pretty reasonable, uh, that goes up to needing to roll 10 on a dice to get it off. Shooting attack, it means the range of all their weapons are essentially uh, at minus two, uh, and reactions, there's so many complexities there, I'm, I'm just not gonna get into it, but that's what it's doing. So you really wanna exploit that extra two inches with uh, what you've got over your opponent and punish them for making mistakes, not to mention failing charges. A common Alpha Legion strategy, right of war dependent, will involve taking ample long range weapons to ensure your opponent needs to come to you and having a number of assault based units to make that crucial counter assault. So what you want it to do is make sure your opponent, their units are running up the table to you, you're, you're firing at them while it's happening, they're not able to get range on you as much at the same time because all their weapons are at minus two inches. And the big one is that when they go for that final assault, uh, the extra two inches there can make such a big difference and you really want to take advantage of a, of a failed charge or two to then make your own charges yourself. Now for that long range firepower, I think heavy support squads with las cannons, Volkite culverins and missile launchers are the better choice. So you're getting more weapons for your points. If you're making the enemy come to you, you don't need the maneuverability of vehicles that you're paying premium points for. And you can support these squads with apothecaries for added survivability, not to mention take better advantage of cover. You have a serious advantage to getting the charge off with Alpha Legion units. So picking assault based units that get a bonus for charging is a safe decision. A big assault squad is perfect for this, taking advantage of the ability to wait behind your lines that comes from their greater movement and to then get those Hammer of Wrath hits when charging. Alpha Legion are rather unique in the way that they have a second Legion special rule, Rewards of Treachery. I will go into that in depth next as part of the Coils of Hydra Rite of War. So, secondly, right of wars. The right of wars and how they're gonna impact your army building. The real spiciness of Alpha Legion comes down to what unit or units you're selecting for your rewards of treasury 
special rule. Now, for those that aren't aware, I'm not going to read the rule out verbatim, but the concept is you pick one single other legion other than your own, and you get to choose legion specific units from that that are not unique, so not special characters, that you would like to include in your army. So a good example is if we look at the Iron Warriors, you could include some Siege Tyrants from the Iron Warriors in your army. Usually just one unit, but if you're running the Coils of Hydra special rule, you get to include three. So let's read out that Rite of War. The effects. A detachment using this Rite of War may include up to three of the units selected as part of the Rewards of Treachery special rule. Each of these units is paid for as normal and uses up the normal force org slots for a unit of that type as per the restrictions of the Rewards of Treachery special rule. All units selected as part of a detachment using this right of war by means of the Rewards of Treachery special rule gain the Fearless special rule until at least one other friendly unit has been deployed from reserves onto the battlefield. All units selected as part of the detachment using this right of war without the use of the Rewards of Treachery Special Rule, so this is your Alpha Legion units, gain a bonus of plus one to all to hit rolls made for them in all attacks, both shooting and melee, made during the player turn in which they are deployed onto the battlefield. So just to cover off, what that means is you, you get three Reward of Treachery units. Uh, they don't all have to be the same unit. They do all have to come from the same Legion. When they're deployed and you can only, uh, we'll get into this in a minute, you can only deploy the reward of treachery units at the start of the game, so those other legion units, they're all fearless until the rest of your army or parts of your army then come onto the table, and when your other parts of your army, your, your organic alpha legion units, if you will, are coming onto the table, the turn in which they arrive, they get plus one to hit for shooting in melee. Now, limitations. All units selected as part of a detachment using this right of war by means of the rewards of treachery special rule must be deployed on the battlefield at the start of the first turn. They may not be placed in reserves or assigned to a deep strike assault, subterranean assault, or flanking assault, or any other deployment option that requires them to start in reserves. A detachment using this right of war must include a number of units selected without the use of the rewards of treachery special rule, equal to or greater than the number of units selected using the rewards of treachery special rule. These units must begin the battle in reserves or assigned to a deep strike, assault, subterranean assault, or flanking assault, or other deployment options that require them to start in reserves. So essentially you're splitting your army in half. You've got those other Legion units that you've selected up to three that are starting on the table and they're fearless and the rest of your army, your organic Alpha Legion section of it, if you will, uh, is starting off the table in reserves and getting that bonus to hit when arriving. So what are the pros? Uh, the main pro of this, uh, the main benefit is you get three units from other legions. Super cool. Uh, there's some great choices out there that we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, normally you only get one as an alpha legion army, army. Coils of Hydra, you get three. Uh, they are fearless for those first one or two turns, uh, maybe even more depending on when your reserves come on uh, until the rest of your army comes onto the table. Fearless is really good. Uh, there's, you can't understate how great Fearless is, and it's quite rare within uh, within second edition Heresy. So Fearless is fantastic. But the big one here is just the awesome narrative flavor uh, that comes with this Rite of War and just taking advantage of, of other legions and, and the shenanigans that goes with it. It's a lot of fun. It's very unique in the way it plays. So I think this is just a really fun Rite of War and, uh, and just really different. Now the cons, there are a few cons. So you've only got three units and potentially their transports, I might add, uh, on the table for the first turn and perhaps longer, maybe second turn, maybe even third turn. Uh, what this is doing is giving up early turns of potential objective scoring, depending on the mission, and, and at least letting your opponent get the upper hand with early game board control. It's also meaning that those units that start the game on the table are going to be more vulnerable because they're not going to have the support of the rest of your army and your opponent's going to be able to focus on them without worrying about... Uh, I guess, uh, making themselves vulnerable to, uh, to other units than just those that are on the table, just the three, maybe more with, uh, with transports. So it also more so, uh, I can't hear, doesn't make great use of the box set. And I'll go into that uh, a little more, but essentially you're not going to want to use a Spartan, for instance. Uh, Dreadnoughts aren't great in this army. Uh, beakies become become less important because you're spending so many points uh, on those Legion units, but you, you'll still need them a bit. But the main ones being the Spartan and the Dreadnought just don't have great place in this army. 
Now the impacts, what are the impacts of this right of war on the way you're going to build an army? So you're going to favor a far more aggressive army that wants to be in transports or have the ability to deep strike. For the three units selected from other legions, I'd be tempted to go for units with longer range firepower and survivability. As I've mentioned before, Tyrant Siege Terminators are the obvious choice. But you could equally go for assault units, and I think this is a bit more fun, with either inherent movement bonuses or transports to hit home at the same time that your second force, your Alpha Legion force, is arriving from reserves. In which case, Ultramarine Invictaris Suzerain squads, Imperial Fist Templar Brethren, or a mix of Raven Guard, Dark Fury, and more Dathan squads are all powerful and lore-driven choices. While narratively dubious, Galvorback squads would also do some serious work in this army, but I just couldn't justify it from a lore perspective. For the force arriving from reserves, I'd be taking characters and units with jump packs that still have some decent shooting, supported by close range tactical support squads in Rhinos. Note that the buff is for shooting and melee on the turn they deploy, so taking advantage of both is going to be key. Assault squads are the obvious choice, uh, backed up by apothecaries and beatstick praetors or centurions with jump packs. But having a couple of cheap tactical squads to walk onto your backline and secure objectives will also be vital. Remember that if you take Alpharius, you can deep strike three units, units at your leisure. Any units, I might add. But the rewards of treachery units are going to be pricey. Those, uh, those elite other legion units do not come cheap, so I don't think you can afford a Primarch in this build. You're going to want to avoid infantry with heavy weapons and vehicles that lose firepower when moving. Similarly, you'll be choosing units mostly from troops and fast attack, as you'll likely need those elite slots for the rewards of treachery units. So while destroyer squads sound fun in this build, you're probably not going to have room for them. I'd only be taking Dreadnoughts in this force if you're willing to pay the drop pod tax, uh, both in points and in cold hard cash. They're certainly, they aren't bad walking onto the table from reserves, but more maneuverable units of jet bikes and land speeders will find greater value coming in when it comes to supporting that aggressive force that I talked about before. We're also running into the elite slots limitation again. And yes, Leviathan Dreadnoughts are heavy sport, but they get real expensive real fast when you have to put them in a drop pod. I just don't think you have the point spare with all those juicy units from the other legions. Now, while all of that sounds like a lot of fun and will be very popular for Alpha Legion players, a more traditional force, and one that will likely be able to afford Alpharius, and I do love my Primarchs, uh, will be looking at the Headhunter Leviathal Rite of War. Now, this Rite of War reads uh, the effects. A detachment using this Rite of War may take Headhunter kill teams as troops choices and fast attack choices. If an army includes a detachment using this Rite of War, then the Slay the Warlord secondary objective if it is in use in the battle being played, and hopefully it is, is worth an additional plus two victory points to the controlling player of a detachment with this right of war. During the first game turn, all units composed entirely of models with the infantry unit type and Legiones Astartes Alpha Legion special rule gain the Shrouded 5 plus special rule while at least 12 inches away from an enemy unit. That's fantastic. Uh, now the limitations, all models with the vehicle unit type in a detachment using this right of war must begin play in reserves. A detachment using this right of war must also include more fast attack choices than heavy support choices. Quite an impact on how you're gonna build. So what are the pros here? Uh, headhunters. Headhunters are a lot of fun, very fluffy for Alpha Legion units and can do some serious damage uh, by picking off various characters with their precision shots. Now, uh, when it comes to using the box set, you can, I assume, upgrade those Mark VI, VI Beakies with the Headhunter upgrades that you get from Forge World. I don't think that'd look too strange. I think it's actually gonna look pretty good. Uh, so this build is gonna make much better use of the box set than the, uh, the Coils of Hydra Rite of War. It's also a lot more flexible in its approach to achieving missions. Uh, the Coils of Hydra army build is really, it's gonna do one thing. It's gonna be super aggressive, right up in their face, uh, it's only got one approach to really do what you need to do, uh, and it's not great at scoring objectives and holding objectives as such. So I think the, the Headhunter, Leviathal, uh, Rite of War gives you a lot more flexibility in the way you play. So you're not gambling on keeping the majority of your army off the table in the early game. 
this is, you know, just putting three units on the table can be can be a little dangerous. And uh, and this one, you're, you're not taking that risk. Uh, it also plays to the Alpha Legion strengths and Legion special rule a lot more. What I talked about before, the, the game plan that you want to take advantage of lives and obfuscation with those longer range units and, and that counter assault piece, this Rite of War definitely plays to that in, in a better way. Now, what are the cons? <laughs> Vehicles have to begin the game in reserves. I assume that includes transports. So... That's rough. Uh, so this Rite of War is not going to see many vehicles really at all. I'd probably I'd probably leave them at home if going down this direction. Uh, it does need more fast attack choices and heavy support choices, which which is fine because most of those vehicles are in the heavy support and we've decided to, to, to leave them behind. Um, and look, fast fast attack is definitely supporting what you want to do with this in, in a bigger way, and we'll get to that in a second. So what are the impacts on army building? The most glaring impact is that you're potentially not going to want to include any vehicles or transports in an army build using this ride war. As I said, you, you want to hit hard and fast with this army. Uh, so I want to build a force full of infantry, cavalry, and dreadnoughts. First things first, we're here for the headhunter kill teams. These are so spicy, and while I'll keep a deep dive on unit rolls for another day and unit rules, let's just say you're going to want at least two of these. Be aware that, while these can be taken as troops, I'd be more inclined to take them as fast attack, opening up my heavy support squads, and still include some more traditional troops choices that have the line unit subtype, tactical squads probably being the go-to and still useful here. Just for narrative sake, you're going to want to take a saboteur console, either putting him in one of your kill teams or running solo with his false colors special rule. Just because it's cool, it fits what you're doing, uh, and it's a lot of fun. Alpha Legion is special and can do it, so why wouldn't you? Now, you can play this army in a number of ways. You can utilize the organic infiltrate of the kill teams and the three units Alpharius or Armulus Dynat, it should be mentioned if you're going for a cheaper option, uh, that they give it to, to get right up in the face of the opponent as quickly as possible. Or you could use that infiltrate and redeploy shenanigans to position your kill teams to outflank the opponent and dominate midfield objectives, while still drawing an opponent into a solid firebase of heavy support squads and counter assault units. Indeed, you can build an army to take advantage of both styles of play and let your opponent's force determine your course of action. If the opponent can outshoot you, you infiltrate your entire army onto their doorstep. If the opponent is close combat focused, use your kill teams as midfield speed bumps and sit back and shoot. Other units I want to take in this army include those counter assault units I talked about previously. That could be Terminators, but a 15 to 20 man assault squad gives you greater flexibility. But hey, why not both? You really want to have two beefy assault units to take advantage of Alpharius's infiltrating handouts if the opponent outshoots you, which leaves one infiltrating spot for a Contemptor Dreadnought. These tough lads do great work in this army as they get around that vehicle limitation and you don't need to worry about your kill teams taking up elite slots. An infiltrating Dreadnought also sounds intense and I love it. If you have the points and the heavy support slot, noting the right of war limitation, you could even go with Leviathan Dreadnought here as the infiltrating ability helps it out with its commonly short ranged but powerful firepower. Note that if you've gone the cheaper option with Armillus Dynat as your warlord, then you can't infiltrate anything other than infantry. So if you want infiltrating dreadnoughts, it's got to be Alpharius. As I've already mentioned, I want to spend my heavy support force organization slots on multiple heavy support squads that will do a lot of work in this army, taking advantage of that first turn shrouded and forcing your opponent to come to you. Laz cannons and missile launchers are the priority here, as the kill teams have your anti-infantry firepower largely covered. For fast attack, jet bikes and land speeders of both type continue that theme of flexibility able to support an all-infiltrating army, but also providing units to act as distractions and speed bumps if playing more conservatively. When it comes to what units you're going to want to select for your one reward of treachery choice, it really comes down to taste. Have some fun with it. Alpha Legion specific units aren't necessarily fast or combat focused, so something to fill that gap would work perfectly fine. Perhaps a unit of Blood Angel Dawnbreaker cohort for adding some serious punch to that counter assault, or a White Scars Golden Kesheg Squadron for hunting down vehicles that your heavy support squads can't get line of sight to. Both of these Rite of Wars give you really interesting options for army builds, and hopefully I've given you a decent idea of how to build them out to keep the army narratively focused, but also taking best advantage of the Alpha Legion special rules, effects, and limitations. When it comes to Alpha Legion Warlord traits, only the Mobius Configuration Warlord trait has any significant impact. 
Note that it is a loyalist warlord trait, but unless I'm mistaken, no Alpha Legion units or characters are identified as being traitors. So you still get your full selection, which is a great nod to the narrative and lots of fun. The Mobius Configuration Warlord Trait reads, This Warlord Trait may only be selected with a model with the Loyalist Allegiance. An army whose Warlord has this trait counts any allied detachment that has any version of the Legiones Astartes Special Rule as though it had the Fellow Warriors level of allegiance, regardless of the variant of the Legiones Astartes Special Rule it has. Units from this allied detachment that are removed as casualties do not score victory points for the opposing player regardless of the mission objectives in play. And if all models that were part of the allied detachment have been removed as casualties at the end of the battle, the controlling player gains plus one victory point. No unit in the allied detachment may make reactions of any kind, but the first unit in the primary detachment to make a reaction each turn does not use up a point of the controlling player's reaction allotment when making that reaction. This encourages a whole other playstyle, essentially setting up an allied detachment to fall upon the swords of your enemy and giving the rest of your army more reactions. I think it's really powerful. It also gives access to pretty much, well, it does, any legion, uh, for, and in a, a, a way that is powerful to the alpha legion player. It's a really good warlord trait. Um, so you, you've just, you've got to love it. I think it's fantastic. You could really pick any legion here as the alpha legion were betraying loyalists and traders alike all over the place, but from a narrative perspective, a White Scars, Raven Guard, Sons of Horus, or World Eaters Detachment are all great choices, and do what you want to do with this smaller force, which is get up in the enemy's face. I'd focus the allied detachment on combat units or short range powerful firepower that the enemy simply can't ignore, leaning more towards those units that natively have higher movement, can infiltrate, or deep strike to save on transport costs. These units could then act as that speed bump I talked about in the Headhunter Leviathan analysis, giving you another way to play that takes full advantage of the Alpha Legion's special rules, but without the vehicle limitations of the Rite of War. Furthermore, your speed bump units now are not going to give victory points to the enemy. It's, just, it's really good from an, from an objective and from a point scoring perspective. I think this Warlord trait is out of control. Now, if you want to include a number of vehicles in your Alpha Legion army, this Warlord trait is a great compromise and a fun way to build an army. Probably the best way to go, rather than the rights of war that we've seen. And you could pick a generic right of war out of the, out of the core rulebook. You get to paint up a detachment from another Legion and then run them to your deaths. What more could an Alpha Legion player want? I'd keep the Allied Detachment relatively small. I don't know what the rules are yet around Allied Detachments, but I imagine it has to be less than your, your main detachment. Uh, certainly less than half your points, uh, as you'll be throwing them straight into the jaws of the enemy to ensure they will die. You want them to die. Meanwhile, focus your Alpha Legion Detachment on longer range firepower and units to secure and hold objectives. The tougher, the better. So, how to build a Raven Guard army. First up, box set. The box set is a great starting place for Raven Guard Army. Both from a build perspective and from an aesthetic perspective, the Raven Guard being the first legion to field test and implement the Mark VI armor on a wide scale. Mark VI supports stealth operations and so is perfect for your Raven Guard infantry. Raven Guard are a really flexible legion whose rules encourage a pretty balanced approach to army building, though certainly favor an infantry heavy army that, depending on how you build your army, will see greater benefits in combat. Due to this, you will definitely have a use for those Mark VI Marines, using them as either tactical squads, support squads, veteran squads, or as a base for assault squads. Depending on what options we get for building assault squads in the future, the Mark VI with some 3D printed jump packs may be the way to go. GW, however, if you're listening, please give us a Mark V assault squad in plastic, and I'll love you forever. While Tartarus armor may be more suited to the nature and aesthetics of the Raven Guard, you can totally use those Cataphracti in your force. They certainly get the same rules benefits from the Raven Guard Legion Special Rule. However, the Raven Guard Rites of War aren't particularly friendly to Cataphracti Terminators with their heavy subtype, so these may not see much use if you go down that route. The Raven Guard aren't too opposed to big units of Tartarus Terminators or other non jump pack infantry, so I think that a Spartan will come in handy. Having a Primarch that doesn't need it for delivery does reduce its necessity in a Raven Guard army, however. The Dreadnought will be useful in a Raven Guard army, and I'd definitely put a close combat weapon on it to take advantage of the Falcon's special rule. 
maybe even two. Honestly, it's going to be a rare legion that doesn't want a Contemptor Dreadnought running around. They're just such good models, and their rules are not shabby. The Praetor, Praetors are fine for a Raven Guard army, uh, if not specifically matching the Raven Guard aesthetic. I mean, the beak, the beak is appreciated. Uh, so the, I guess, the loyalist-ish looking one is pretty good, uh, and they get pretty grim during the uh, during the um, guerrilla war that they're fighting during the Horus Heresy. So the Axe guy even could uh, could suit nicely. But what I'd be looking to do is put a jump pack on the back of them uh, because you really want your Raven Guard characters to be in those those beefy jump pack units getting into assault and essentially dictating where the assaults happen and getting the charge off. So I don't know what the jump packs look like on those box set Praetors, but I'm sure it'll work. Now with that covered, let's have a chat about the Raven Guard special rule. The, uh, the special rule, Shadow and Fury, uh, and what build that supports. So. Shadow and Fury. Models with the Legiones Astartes Raven Guard special rule gain one of three special rules based on its unit type and war gear, either Talons, Falcons, or Hawks. Now, what does that mean? I won't read this out entirely, but essentially those three categories, um, those that go into the Talons category are your basic infantry units. Those that go into the Falcons category are your Dreadnoughts and those with the heavy unit subtype. Uh, also those with Jump Axe and Tartarus Terminator Armor. For those that go into the Hawks category, it is models with the special rule Raven Guard that are cavalry um, or vehicle units that are either flyers or fast. So your regular tanks aren't getting any special rule benefits from this special rule. Now, the special rules that go with those, so those Talons, once again, your basic infantry, if a unit composed entirely of models with a Talon special rule is targeted by a shooting attack, all models in the unit gain the Shrouded 6 plus special rule if the attacking unit is more than 8 inches from any model in the target unit. In addition, all models with this special rule also gain the Infiltrate special rule. How many times can you say special rule? Infiltrate's great. Uh, giving that to all of your regular infantry is so good. Right, Falcons, any model with this special rule may reroll all failed to win rolls of 1 in any assault phase in which they make a successful charge, even if that charge is considered disordered. This actually falls a little flat for me. It's good for certain units, uh, certainly a big unit of Tartarus Terminators that, that I was talking about before, uh, noting that they, yeah, they, they're, they're, in this, they're in this bag. Uh, however, not if you're putting Lightning Claws on them. Um, furthermore, the, a lot of the characters, sorry, units that get in the Falcon category are going to get rerolls to win from one way or another. So it's a dip, bit disappointing. Um, it is what it is though. And the Hawks, lastly, any model with this special rule gains the Shrouded 6 plus special rule on any turn in which they run, move flat out, or move as a zooming flyer. With this benefit lasting, blah, 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 blah. Um, the Shrouded 6 plus, it can be Shrouded 5 plus if they've already got Shrouded. That's, that's pretty much it. So, as you can see, these special rules give a bonus to most units, uh, barring vehicles that aren't flyers or fast, which is, of course, most vehicles. I wouldn't be concerned about picking vehicles that fit into the requirements of the Hawk special rule um, and, and making a thing of it in Raven Guard armies. The only fast vehicles that I could find were the Legion Saber Strike Squadrons, so not that many. Uh, and to get the Shrouded special rule, the vehicle has to be moving flat out, which is risky. Um, you can take damage doing it, and usually degrades your shooting as well. Uh, in this way, Raven Guard naturally steer away from vehicles, both battle tanks and transports, that are made redundant for many units due to their infiltrate rules, uh, inherent protection from being shrouded. Be mindful that many of the units that receive the Falcon, Falcon Special Rule, this is what I talked about before, uh, they've got shred weapons. So Lightning Claws, good example. Um, the Dark Fury uh, Special Unit that the that the Raven Guard get fall into this category and they're, they're getting shred as well. I believe all chain swords. And I could be wrong here, but I believe in, and I'm so close to getting the rules, that all chain swords give shred to, to everyone that has it. And that's all your assault squads, right? So they lose out a bit on this bonus. Not that usable. but uh, and, and furthermore, there's other heavy units that fall into this category that aren't going to want to be an assault. Uh, for instance, heavy support squads. They don't really care about reroll wounds to run in an assault phase that they charge. So the Falcon rule... It's just a bit flat for me, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, it does feel good, though, on a unit with power fists, because they're usually winning on twos, and rolling ones hurts, so getting to re-roll those is pretty nice. So those Tartarus Terminators I talked about, I'd be chucking power fists on them to take advantage of this, if you think they're going to get the charge off. Uh, in this way, the Raven Guard naturally benefits an infantry-based army that wants to get close to the enemy, deep striking where possible, which I'll talk about a bit more later, and pushing for combat. 
Balancing this with some close range shooting support is definitely viable, as well as dreadnoughts to back up your infantry, potentially coming down in drop pods so they don't get left behind. Now the Raven Guard's two right of wars are very characterful, have plenty of power behind them and encourage some really unique army builds that further the themes we've already seen with the Raven Guard special rules. First up, let's talk about Decapitation Strike. This right of war reads... Oh, the fluff is so good. Alright, just the effects though. All models with the Legionis, Astartes, a Raven Guard special rule in a detachment using this right of war gain the preferred enemy independent character's special rule. All models in any unit from a detachment using this right of war assigned to a deep strike assault or flanking assault gain the shrouded 5 plus special rule for the duration of the game turn, interesting, in which they are deployed to the battlefield. In missions that use victory points, an army that includes a detachment using this right of war gains an additional two victory points for the Slay, the Warlord, secondary objective. Now limitations, a detachment using this right of war may only include a single heavy support choice, and a detachment using this right of war may not take fortifications. So what are the pros? Preferred enemy independent characters is rerolls to hit against not only the independent characters themselves, giving your characters a nice bonus in their jewels, but it also applies for the whole enemy unit uh, that are accompanying that character that you're attacking, unless this changes in the final rules. Please, please don't hold me to that. This is really nice. So every squad that you assault that has a cheeky independent character of some description kicking around in it, and that will be common in Heresy, uh, you're getting rerolls to hit against that entire unit, uh, as well as any, any potential duel that occurs Super spicy uh, and really nice bonus to, uh, to close combat there. The Shroud of 5 Plus for all deep striking units is really nice, though, and correct me if I've gotten this wrong, it seems you get a greater benefit out of it if you are the first player in a game turn, getting it both in your turn uh, that you deep strike and then keeping it in your opponent's turn. If you're going second in a game, you only get it on your turn and not your opponent's. That seems unfortunate. I don't know if that's what they intended, but I guess Raven Guard, it's kind of, it's characterful for them to want to be going first to have the initiative. So maybe that's why it's there. But I have seen it in other rules as well. It seems to be something that GW spread around, uh, but, but fine, well, we can deal with that. So decent protection against reactions is really what we're looking at here when you're deep striking. So when you deep strike, an opponent can potentially get off two or maybe even three reactions against that deep striking unit. If you're, if you're charging in with it, if you're within a certain range of them, etc. A reminder that this seems to apply to Dreadnoughts that come in by Drop Pod as well. So you're getting a Shrouded not only in your, your Assault Squads and your, your Infantry, various types that are, that are coming in uh, very by Drop Pod or by Deep Striking through Jump Packs, uh, but your Dreadnoughts that you bring in by Drop Pod looks like they get Shrouded as well, which is pretty cool. It's great protection for those units, uh, just in case the enemy's got some sneaky reactions they're going to pop on you before you start trying to charge in. The last bit here, the extra victory points uh, for the Slay the Warlord, always good. One VP may not sound like much, but in low scoring missions, it can really make a difference. And if nothing else, it helps you play mind games with your opponent who may hold their Warlord back because they don't want to give away two victory points. And if they're holding their, their super choppy Warlord back or something that was handing out buffs to their other units and they're, they're putting them in a bad place and not getting those buffs or not getting to do some choppiness with it, that's pretty good. And that alone is, is kind of worth this cool little rule. So what are the cons? Now it does only have a single heavy support choice, which is which is pretty impactful. Uh, but you know what? We kind of already talked that Raven Guard armies don't really want to be taking vehicles. Most heavy support choices are vehicles. We talked about the heavy support squads aren't really getting much of a benefit in this army. So I'm not too upset about it, really. Um, the Leviathan's probably what I want to take for this heavy support choice, if I'm going to take one at all. And once you chuck that thing in a big drop pod, you probably can't afford more than one anyway. So I'm not, I'm not too upset. Uh, a Fire Raptor Gunship, another great choice for this heavy support slot. Once again, super expensive. You're definitely not going to be taking more than one and you probably can't fit in a Leviathan and, uh, and a Fire Raptor Gunship in the same army. So look, both good units, both good choices. Once you chuck them in there uh, and you're filling it out with all the kind of infantry that are going to that are doing what the Raven Guard wants to be doing, it doesn't feel too bad. The fortifications, I don't really care about at all. That's that's fine. Makes sense. They've put it in there for a narrative reason. Uh, I don't see myself taking fortifications unless we shockingly get some amazing rules for them or some amazing models. Wait and see. So what are the impacts here? So I really want to focus on deep striking units with this right of war for, for obvious reasons. Uh, the shrouded, of course, and, and whatnot. So you're looking at assault squads, you're looking at destroyers with jump packs. You're looking at any unit that can take a drop pod. Um, really, any unit if you're able to chuck them in a in a 
one of those claw drop pod boys, uh, noting that that gets pretty expensive pretty fast. Uh, flies that can deep strike. Now, not all flies can deep strike. Uh, the Xiphon enters in a, in a slightly different way, but the Storm Eagle and the Fire Raptor are good to go for this, for this army. Land speeders and jet bikes can also deep strike. Uh, so they're great in this list for some heavy power, firepower uh, that is still deep striking, though admittedly not optimal from a Shadow and Fury perspective. Um, that, you know, bonus to Shrouded if they're moving super fast, eh, not, not that great. I want them to be shooting, right? Dark Fury squads are made for this army, both rule-wise and from a narrative perspective. So you definitely want at least one of these kicking about. Uh, Dark Fury squads being the Raven Guard special uh, jump pack unit that you can take. They are going to absolutely rip Marines apart in close combat. They're just, they're good and they're really characterful and they're getting all the benefits that you want to be getting from this right of war. Korax. Now, Korax can deep strike. So if you want to include him in an army, he definitely has a place in this right of war. His ability to give infantry and cavalry the Crusader special rule also further buffs the close combat shenanigans of this army, and it's starting to get super powerful at this point. Now, saying that, I kind of want to include a Warlord who has a Hidden Hand Warlord trait instead, uh, and I'll read that out when we get to the Warlord section. But I'm, I'm in two minds. Do you go Korax? I guess if you have the points. Depends what your army looks like, right? So Korax, great choice if that's the way you want to go. If you want to include some, you know, Leviathans in, in there and you don't have the points for Korax anymore, one Leviathan, I should say, uh, then maybe you grab this Hidden Hand Warlord trait, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Next, you, you just, you can't go wrong with, with Korax though, right? A Deep Striking Primarch, super scary, right in their face, noting you can now assault out of Deep Strike, super tough, and even tougher with that free Shroud of 5+, plus on the turn he comes down. Brutal. Love it. So, that's Decapitation Strike. Seems really powerful, uh, really narratively driven, but the next Rite of War, Liberation Force, is pushing that narrative button up to 11, the dial. You push dials up to 11. Do you turn them? Who can say? Either way, Liberation Force looks really fun, really cool. I love the fluff behind it. Let's have a look. I'm going to read the flavor text out too, just because it's really nice, and it, it will situate people who don't quite know what the Raven Guard were up to, post is fan. So, in the aftermath of the Dropsite Massacre, it was feared that Lord Korax, Primarch of the Raven Guard, had fallen, but in fact he had survived and led several thousand of his sons on a 98-day campaign of vengeance and survival before his force was extricated from Istvan V. Having returned to the Legion's homeworld, Korax led the Raven Guard on a campaign to liberate the peoples of numerous worlds across the southern Imperium whose leaders had declared for the War Master. With each world freed from the yoke of treachery, another loyalist army was raised, and the scales of justice tipped but a fraction back in favour of terror. So this is all about the guerrilla campaign that the Raven Guard were, were carrying on with during the Horus Heresy, uh, helping worlds liberate themselves uh, with lots of armies of, of non-post humans and essentially just building these insurgent forces to, to carry out this insurgent war across the south of the Imperium. So really cool. So what are the effects? Once per battle, at the start of any game turn, the controlling player may choose to have all models with the Legionis of Starting's Raven Guard special rule in a detachment using this right of war gain the stubborn special rule for the duration of that game turn. There's that game turn piece again. All models from an allied detachment that is part of an army whose primary detachment is using this right of war gain the stubborn special rule. Now that allied detachment, we'll get to it in the limitations, but it has to be a Solar Auxiliar or Imperialis Militia uh, allied detachment. So they're stubborn all the time. Lastly, for the benefits here, all models in a unit composed entirely of models with the Legionis of Starter special rule, Raven Guard, gain the hatred everything special rule, while at least one model, just one model from that unit is within six inches of any model from an allied detachment in the same army. That's going to be a huge amount of the battlefield. Um, and that, that's really good. Hatred everything. That's that's awesome. Uh, Rerolls to hits people. Uh, now, limitations. A detachment using this right of war may not include any models with the slow, heavy, artillery, bombard, or automated artillery subtypes. Ooh, big hit. Next, a detachment using this right of war must have the Loyalist Allegiance. And this right of war may only be selected for a primary detachment. And lastly, as I said, an army whose primary detachment is using this right of war must include an allied detachment that is selected from the Solar Auxiliar or Imperialis Militia Army List that includes at least four units. Right, so what are the pros here? 
Stubborn for a game turn. Noting that game turn, once again, you want to be going first. It's awkward. Why would they make it game turn? That's fine. St well, they could have said until the start of your next turn. We've seen that so often from GW. So making it game turn just seems weird. A am I missing something here? But whatever. You want to go first. So stubborn for a game turn for all of your Astartes is really nice. Though once again, seems to, as I said, weirdly benefit going first. Uh, stubborn is going to be very useful in the new edition. With leadership modifiers flying around the battlefield, especially from those enemies causing fear, and combats being decidedly brutal in this edition. Legions are going to live and die on those leadership checks at the end of combats. There is nothing worse than losing combat by one or two unlucky wounds and having a massive expensive unit wiped off the table from, a, from an unlucky leadership check. Even better, the entirety of your mandatory allied detachment, which must be you know, those, those humans, is stubborn, all of them, and at least four units of them, for the whole game. This is going to allow you to make some really nasty tar pits for enemy assault-based legions, tying up their expensive units while you pick off the vulnerable parts of their army and then, and then counter-assault with your, with your spicy, you know, lightning, claw-wielding, wielding crazy jump-pack dudes. Hatred on Astartes units within six of your allied detachment sounds a little circumstantial, but noting that it's kind of any model from each unit, it should cover a pretty broad area of the table and you're definitely going to be getting it off, which is going to be powerful when you do. Uh, the key will be using big blobs of basic human wretches to soak up charges, all, the, all those militia, and counter charge with your, your super bird themed killers. So I really like this ride of war. It is so fluffy. The narrative is just really nice and the way they've written these rules to match that narrative is beautiful. It supports the Raven Guard doing what they want to be doing uh, while also being a great excuse to include some of the new good looking human shaped miniatures we've seen coming out of GW. I absolutely love those Ash Waste Nomads. I think they're so good. And seeing those as a bit of a bit of a militia insurgency kind of situation, I think would look so cool against those clean cut Raven Guard. Now the cons. The limitations on this are pretty significant, though kind of support what we've already identified as the Raven Guard's optimal playstyle. You can definitely still build a decent Raven Guard army to this right of war, but you lose out on a bunch of fun stuff. Uh, the heavy limitation in particular is the big one for me. It means you can't use Cataphracti Terminators that you get in the box set, which really hurts. I would have thought about that if I were GW. Uh, there's also a bunch of other units that have heavy uh, breaches. For example, there's heavy support squads. There's lots. So my advice would be probably not to build only to this right of war and uniquely to this right of war, but perhaps just keep it in mind as a, as a fun alternate way to play for a more narrative game. The impacts on model selection. As I've already discussed, you lose out on a lot of units. So be it, uh, but you're getting the benefits from the usual Raven Guard suspects we've already mentioned. This Rite of War also isn't necessarily focused on the Deep Strike style of play. The Decapitation Strike is, so it gives you a bit more flexibility in the way you play your games, which is always nice, instead of just dropping everyone in and going ham on those, on those post-Deep Strike charges. Expensive units, like big blobs of Tartarus Terminators or 20 strong Despoiler squads, I think would be super spicy. They really like this Rite of War. Uh, stubborn is really helpful for these expensive close combat units so that you don't lose them to an unlucky assault phase. So take the opportunity where you get it to include these kind of units in an army. Getting hatred on these units really pushes them over the top too and, and makes them quite powerful. If you want to include vehicles like that new plastic Spartan you've just found yourself with, this Rite of War will not hold you back, but you're spending points on units that won't gain any benefits from either this Rite of War or the Raven Guard Legion Special Rules. Saying that, a big unit of Tartarus Terminators in a Land Raider Spartan seems like a really solid option here, so that's that's fine. The Despoilers will get infiltra Infiltrate if you include them, so you don't need to worry about transports for them, uh, so it's more just those those Terminators, essentially, and the only ones you can take are Tartarus. They're probably the only ones that want to be jumping in this Spartan because everyone else you take in this list is either infiltrating or jumping around in jump packs. Now, I hear Contempted Dreadnoughts with double close combat weapons really like Hatred, so consider a couple of these big boys to back up your infantry rather than going down the tank route. That'd, that'd be my advice. Uh, assault squads, Dark Fury squads will, of course, be mandatory in this list, just like any Raven Guard list. Making sure you're getting to where you need to be on the table to make sure you're backing up your allied detachments in the assaults that they get into to take advantage of hatred. High movement on these units is going to be really key to be where you want to be to take advantage of this right of war rules. Your allied detachment wants to be, as I said, big blobs of infantry with the best leadership you can give them. Maybe some, some independent characters to beef up that leadership in each unit. Nothing fancy. You can insert some great cheap shooting units here or there. Um, 
Noting that the big blobs, their weapons aren't that impressive. So I'll talk about that in a sec. Now, against a more defensive opponent, this army still kind of packs a punch. Um, I'd prefer to play it against an assaulting opponent where your big blobs of infantry are soaking up those charges. But you know what? Your Raven Guard units can infiltrate, they can deep strike still. So even against a defensive army, you can still get close and into your opponent's lines quickly while your allied detachment then sits back, holds objectives and soaks up, no doubt, the bulk firepower coming towards them. Now, unfortunately, Mordathan, oh, we haven't mentioned them yet. This is the other Raven Guard special Legion unit. They're really nice and they're really cool, but they're, they're focused on either long range or short range shooting. So, and they don't, they don't have a particular place in this right of war from a benefits perspective. Look, I'd still include a cheeky unit. However, it matches the narrative and they still pack a punch in assault if they find themselves in one, you know, if they really need to, right? I'd load them up with melter guns and melter bombs uh, as your army is generally going to be lacking that heavy firepower. Uh, certainly you, you won't be getting that probably from your allied detachment, depending on what units you take. And the rest of your army is quite focused on, on chopping up infantry. So uh, more Dathan, if you're gonna take them, go the anti-take route with them. And on that note, uh, a unit that does it slightly better, perhaps a tactical support squad with melt guns, I think is a must take in this list. It's infiltrating, so it's getting close to tanks right from the start of the game and in the right spot too, once you know where those tanks are deployed, which is great. It's really nice. And it means you don't have to invest in a drop pod or, or you know, vulnerable rhino to chuck them in either. So infiltrating tactical support squads with melter guns seem really spicy to me and I'd be chucking them in this list. Now, both of these rights of war are full of narrative but generally both lean towards an infantry based and, and close combat focused build, which is fitting for a post is fan five Raven Guard. So I get it, but they're a bit samesy samesy. If you're looking to represent a Raven Guard army closer to the Crusade era Legion, going with the core rights of war is probably your best choice rather than one of these. Now, when it comes to the Raven Guard warlord traits, only the hidden hand really impacts the way you might want to play an army. Now that reads, while a warlord with this trait is in reserves, the controlling player may choose to reroll all failed reserves rolls, and when deployed to the battlefield, the warlord and all models in any unit he has joined gain the fleet special rule. That fleet special rule uh, adds to your movement, including your charges, I believe. So that's really nice coming down from Deep Strike, getting a bonus to your charge. Now, in addition, an army whose warlord has this trait may make an additional reaction during the opposing player's movement phase, as long as the warlord has not been removed as a casualty. So this is really nice. While he's sitting in reserves, it means your unit's coming in by deep strike and by, by flanking, whatever it's doing, uh, they're, getting, they're getting the bonuses to re-roll the failed rolls, which is big. It's really big and it means you're going to be getting things when you want them and early in the game as well, which is, which is really important to make sure your, uh, your allied detachment that's sitting around isn't just getting hammered. So this one, the hidden hand, as I was saying, I want to, sorry, not allied detachment, Rewind, uh, you really want this in the decapitation strike right of war if you're, if you're taking it. Either this a guy with this or, or Korax, it's a tough choice, but the benefit this gives to your deep striking coming in when you need it to uh, and to a single unit getting that charge off much more likely from the deep strike is really nice. So keep that in mind, it's a toss up. Um, essentially, I'd, I'd prefer Korax because Primarchs are cool, but if you don't have the points, this is, this is the way to go. Now, without any other characters besides their Primarch making it to second edition, there's not much to talk about in that space. What I'm really hoping to see in the future is some characterful Raven Guard units coming, coming down the pipeline. In particular, I wanna see Bran and his Raptors and the kind of army that creates. I wanna see a unit designed for the Raptors. I wanna see an army full of them. It's going to be so cool. And they're gonna have some sick rules. You heard it here first. It's definitely coming. Can't back that up with any actual facts, but that's going to be wicked. And when we see Bran, that character will no doubt have his own army style. But at the moment, the rights of war are what are predominantly focusing on, on how you build your Raven Guard army. Now, Salamanders are a really interesting army that have a few competing opportunities, making them a bit of a challenge to build and still see success on the table. You at once want to unleash the, uh, the dragon themed flame on your enemies, but delivering that short ranged firepower can be a bit tricky when selecting the most flame filled right of war. Let's get into it. First up is the box set. The box set is absolutely suitable for a Salamander's army, though it really depends on how you feel about Mark VI army, uh, armor, I should say. Uh, personally, I think Mark three and Mark IV armor types suit the Salamanders a bit better. Uh, but it just comes down to personal preferences. I've seen some 
Horus Heresy veterans getting into Mark VI for Salamanders, so you can absolutely do it if that's what you're into. If you're happy to go the bulk Mark VI for your flame-loving legion, then you do you. Tactical squads, tactical support squads, and heavy sport squads are all going to have a place in a Salamanders army. Just because you can, I'd lean towards the Melter, Flamer, Plasma, and Volkite weapons for your sport squads, which are all the fun ones anyway, and it keeps the red hot Salamanders theme going strong. However, there's certainly nothing wrong with kitting out a squad with missile launchers if you need it on the table. Salamanders love a big unit of Terminators, and Cataphracti suit them well. My advice is this. If you're planning on taking Vulcan, the Salamanders Primarch, then your basic Cataphracti boys will get the job done nicely as a unit to accompany him and unleash the pain. If you're not planning on taking Vulcan, I'd probably rather have a unit of Fire Drake Terminators instead. Now this may seem counterintuitive and it may not suit the narrative, but for me it all comes down to stubborn and the damage output. Vulcan gives all of your infantry stubborn. Fire Drakes have it naturally and did no doubt paying for it in their points. Same same, if you've got Vulcan in the unit, you don't really need the extra killing power that the Fire Drakes, or the extra survivability really, that the Fire Drakes are paying for and bringing to the unit. Uh, Vulcan is going to give it to those Cataphracti. But you know what? Fire Drakes also look really cool. So definitely something to think about. Now you could always get creative and, and do some conversion work and use your kit-bashed Cataphracti as either unit, depending on how you're feeling on the day. Salamanders are going to need transports, quite a few of them, and a Spartan is a great starting place. Not much more needs to be said at this point, uh, but a Spartan to deliver your Cataphracti or Fire Drakes and Vulcan if you bring him along is almost a must. Dreadnoughts. Now, Salamanders love Dreadnoughts for reasons I will get into in the next section. Uh, pretty much chuck a big old melter on this bad boy for added flavor and get burning and punching your enemy. When it comes to Praetors, Salamanders don't actually have a lot of good options for, uh, for either their Praetors or the Centurions. Forge World gave up on them a long time ago from a, from a miniatures perspective, and nothing in 40k translates particularly well. The generic characters from Forge World also don't scream Salamanders to me, so I'd maybe grab a head from the Salamanders upgrade set, either the current Forge World one, or, or wait until the new second ed ones come out, uh, and stick it on one of these Praetors for, to give it a little bit of flavor. Salamanders uh, do Love shields and hammers uh, if you're keen to get real creative. So using bits from a Fire Drake miniature on one of the box set Praetors could definitely work. Same, same. Uh, there's some 40k Salamander miniatures out there. Not many, but a few. And some of the older ones may fit the scale a bit better. So converting one of them up or, or mixing them in with, with some of your Praetors that you're getting in the box set may be the way to go if, uh, if you're into converting. Now with that covered, let's have a chat about the Salamander's special rules. That special rule is called Blood of Fire, and it reads, when rolling to wound against a model with this special rule for any attack inflicted by a flame, melter, plasma, or volkite weapon or effect, reduce the result of that roll to wound by minus one. This does not affect the strength of the attack, only the result of the roll to wound. In addition, all models with this special rule that have more than one wound or hull point gain the ill will not die six plus special rule. Instantly, I want to be leaning towards Dreadnoughts and elite units of infantry for this, for, this, uh, for this special rule. But let's dig a bit deeper. It's really important to have a look at the Salamander's Dragon Breath weapons and their psychic discipline before we can have a good analysis of their rules. So, their Dragon Breath weapons are essentially all of their flamers, whether it be flame pistols, flamers, heavy flamers, or flame cannons, um, if, that, if that's a thing, uh, essentially get upgraded. Uh, same, same, they can give these weapons to a bunch of units that couldn't normally have it. Mostly tanks is what I'm talking about there, but the idea is they each get a extra pip of strength. So for instance, a, a regular flamer that you'd have on a tactical support marine goes up to strength five and AP four. So I'm pretty sure the AP improves there as well. Uh, all still assault, that's fine, uh, at least for the, the heavy flamer and the flamer. And it gets the rule dragon's breath. Now this is what we care about here. So this is all flame weapons that the salamanders have get this dragon's breath rule. And this reads, when attacking using the wall of death special rule, which is all about shooting, uh, that's overwatch, right? So when you're shooting flamers at units that are charging you, a weapon with this special rule inflicts D6 hits instead of D3. So this means if you have a full squad of 10 tactical support marines with flamers, when a unit's charging into them, they're going to be doing 10 times D6 hits which is just insane. I think I did the averages in the, the Salamanders um, teaser 
video that I did and it came out to something like eight wounds or eight killed Marines in a, in a regular squad as they're charging on in. It's absolutely nuts. Super powerful. So that's the Dragon's Breath weapon. So keep that in mind as I, as I chat later on about what the army builds are looking like. And I just wanted to touch on the, the psychic discipline of the Salamanders as well. So it's called Fury of the Salamander and it's got a, a psychic power and a, a psychic weapon as well. I'm just going to quickly read out the psychic power so we can talk about that later as well. So the psychic power reads, at the start of their own player's turn, the controlling player of a psyker with this power may choose to make a psychic check. If the check is successful, then all enemy models within 18 of the psyker treat all open terrain as difficult terrain and all difficult terrain as both difficult and dangerous until the start of the psyker's controlling player's next player turn. Interesting. Uh, however, the psyker may not move, make shooting attacks or charge in that turn, which is actually pretty pretty crippling, but that's that's fine. Uh, if the check has failed, the psyker suffers a parallel warp, but may otherwise act normally. So 18 inch bubble of difficult and or dangerous terrain for the enemy. That's really big. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little later. It comes into their defensiveness. So there's some, some super spicy stuff there in regards to what the Salamander is getting for their special rules. That psychic power and that intense flame action has me leaning towards a very defensive army. The one that wants to get right up in your opponent's face and dare them to charge, which is quite unique as defensive armies go. It's kind of cool. It plays really nicely towards a force that can own the board, hold objectives, and isn't scared of getting charged, which is something other more shooting-based legions really struggle with. Units that can take these flamers are first on my list. A tactical support squad and a heavy support squad, both with flame weapons, are a great start. Though the extra poop of strength from the heavy version probably isn't worth the extra points, heavy support slot or heavy subtype that come with it. So maybe just two tactical support squads. Fill up those troops, right? I'd want at least one unit of 10 pyroclasts. Now the pyroclasts are the salamanders, one of their special units. They are absolutely insane. Uh -huh. They can switch their flamey goodness between either anti-infantry or anti-vehicle using them either as a, I think, strength six flamer, which is, which is nuts, or as a, a strength eight melter gun, essentially. Uh, now, they're not exactly cheap in points. I think they're about 30 points. But when compared to a Legion tactical support squad kitted out with melter guns, which are only slightly cheaper, they look absolutely amazing. We're talking, I think, for a unit of five, we're talking like 15 points difference between a unit of pyroclast and a unit of Legion Tactical Support Squad Marines, five of them with melter guns. And for that 15 points, you know, you're getting an extra wound, you're getting two plus save, you're getting extra leadership, you're getting extra attacks, you're getting better weapons, uh, you've got the flexibility. It, you just, you can't compare them. In fact, the more I read about these guys, the more I want to include them in my Alpha Legion army, actually. Now, I could go on, I could go on, but I won't. Um, let's just say the models also are lizardy themed perfection. So get Pyroclast in there. No matter what you're doing with Salamanders, you want a unit of 10, maybe more, maybe more units with, uh, with these guys. So as we're going short range firepower with those Pyroclast, as I said, and with those tactical support squads with Flamers, we're going to need a robust delivery mechanism. If you're picking a Salamanders right of war, this generally leaves you with Rhinos and Land Raiders. I'm pretty worried about how long rhinos are going to survive on the battlefields of the 31st millennium. So land raiders of various kinds may be the best way to go for each of these units that wants to get up the table and set things on fire, or at least your more expensive units. I'd be putting them in land raiders for some added protection and making your opponent choose between shooting at land raiders uh, or shooting at rhinos with weaker squads in them. So if you've got the cash and you kind of hate yourself from a, from a hobby perspective, or if GW blesses us with the plastic version, fingers crossed, uh, a couple of Storm Eagles would be a really interesting choice for a Salamander's army. I'd personally be tempted to leave the Salamander's Rights of War at home and go with a Drop Pod Assault uh, and Drop Pod all that short range firepower straight into the enemy lines. But the Drop Pod Right of War is very restrictive of what units you can and can't take uh, and really suffers in certain missions as well. So it's a bit of a gamble. If you have to choose between tanks and dreadnoughts, uh, I'd go the dreadnoughts. So we've already, we've decided in our Salamander's army, we need, we need flamers, we need transports, they're musts. In regards to more fire support and other supporting units, I'm gonna go the dreadnoughts here as they get the benefit of the minus one to wound from the Salamander special rule, which is so nice on an already high toughness unit. It also gives you some extra punch in combat once your lines inevitably get charged. And if any of the enemy forces actually make it through your dragon's breath, wall of death. 
Now this is going to be yet another infantry heavy army. With that six plus, it will not die for vehicles, just not being a big enough selling point when your dreadnoughts and elite two wind infantry get it as well. Remember those pyro class? Yeah, they've got it will not die, but I'm pretty sure they've got it on a five plus, so even better. Uh, you know who also gets the it will not die bonus and who also loves minus one to wound on a bunch of powerful weapons? Yep, jet bikes and land speeders. Now, unfortunately, there's just not much room for these in either of the Salamander's Rites of War, nor a Drop Pot Assault. Uh, well, I guess you can put them in there, but then they're going in reserve. If you're not running any of these Rites of War, though, I'd seriously consider these units, which are a whole lot tougher when they're being run as Salamanders. For this reason, and the reasons I've already talked about, that it will not die, minus one to wound, Salamanders love Terminators, both generic lads and their own fire, drunk, fire drakes, which I've already mentioned. You're going to be taking a bunch and putting them in a Spartan to support your advance. Aim them at the units in your opponent's army that aren't afraid of running into bulk flamers. Particular things like uh, term enemy Terminators with a two plus save or, or high toughness units. Dreadnoughts, for instance, cannot fuel flamers when running into assault. So get them tangled up with your own Terminators first. So that's the, uh, the generic way that I would build a Salamander's army, just looking at their rules. Let's now take a look at the Salamander Rites of War. So they have two, and they're divided into pre and post Isfan 5 Stars of Warfare. Our first Rite of War, the Covenant of Fire, is all about that flamer action, and I think it will be the more popular option. If maybe not the most interesting. It reads. All right. Right of War, Covenant of Fire, the effects. So the Pyro class squads and Legion tactical support squads that include any models with Dragon's Breath Flamers may be taken as troop choices in a detachment using this Right of War and gain the Line Unit subtype. Big one there. Legion Predators squadrons composed entirely of models with only Dragon's Breath Cannon and Dragon's Breath Heavy Flamers as weapons may be chosen as non-compulsory troop choices in a detachment using this Right of War. Limitations. Detachments using this right of war may not make deep strike assaults. Brutal. Uh, but, however, they may still be assigned to a subterranean assault or flanking assault. Okay. A detachment using this right of war may not include destroy squads or a Moritat. Fine. And a detachment using this right of war must include a Legion Centurion, Legion Cataphracti Centurion, or Legion Tartarus Centurion with the Legion Champion console upgrade. So, what are the pros here? Remember how I was saying the Pyro class look really, really good? Uh, just a reminder, two wounds, two plus save, better leadership. It will not die five plus. I could keep going. Now they're troops. They're troops in this right of war. And more importantly, and you don't see that that often with the rights of war, they gain the line unit subtype, which is also important for objective capturing. This is very significant. Super into it. Uh, a unit just full of Pyro class is a really tasty option. Uh, predator squadrons kitted out with flame weapons and being able to take them as troop choices it's a bit of fun and it's good for a laugh but with so many terminators kicking around that we're about to see uh and their associated power fists i'm just not sure i want to be running hundreds of points worth of tanks into my enemy lines because you're gonna have to get close for those flamer weapons and i'm just not into it i think those die super quickly so those are the pros mostly it's about those power class being troops now the cons uh I'll get the least two impactful ones out of the way first. You need to include a Legion Champion console and you can't bring destroy themed units or characters. Eh, fine, that's fine. Legion Champion, he chops stuff up good. So it's not overly exciting, but close combat's a thing. So you're not gonna lose sleep about having to bring one. Uh, not being able to take destroyers or a Moritat, not that impactful, uh, mostly because of the big limitation on deep striking, which is what you you want your jump pack uh, and Moritat, your jump pack destroyers, I should say. They've got a special name. Can't remember it right now. Uh, and your Moritat getting in there. They want to be deep striking. So seeing as you can't deep strike, you don't want to take them anyway. Now, I think deep, the biggest the biggest limitation here is that you can't deep strike. And I think deep striking is going to be a huge part of second edition. And at least unless it gets balanced pretty soon, pretty powerful. Most armies are going to want something coming in by deep strike. And certainly it would be my preference for most close combat units, Legion pending, uh, to come in by deep strike as well. And, and short range firepower also wants to be coming down in drop pods. Uh, so it's, look, it's tough. It's a tough right of war. So what does this mean for how you're building your army if you're taking this right of war? So you're really already doing the things that we've discussed and the things that you want to be doing with salamanders, but letting you capture objectives while doing it, which is really nice. So your army, 
will look like something. It, it'll, look, it'll include a couple of pyroclasts, at least, uh, in either Land Raiders or Rhinos. It's going to include a couple of units of tactical support squads in Land Raiders or Rhinos. I probably wouldn't want to take more than two, maybe at a max, three Land Raiders in an army. So you're going to want a couple of Rhinos for those weaker squads, that being your tactical support squads. They're going to have to, they're going to, have to get in there. Uh, I want to include a nice, big, beefy unit of Terminators, Fire Drakes or Cataphracti. I'm easy. And probably Vulcan as well and chuck them all in a Spartan uh, and just have a great time with them and ram them straight into my opponent's army as I jump out with Flamers at the same time. Now, why take Vulcan? It's because of all that stubborn. That stubborn that he gives to all of your infantry that we mentioned before, and that's super nice. Though arguably, maybe not necessary once the enemies had to charge past that wall of death. So maybe you can save points uh, and just go with the, the Legion Praetor, which you have to run because they've got the, uh, the Masters of Legion special rule that you need to take a right of war. So you want to include a couple of Dreadnoughts if you can, in this, if you can afford it in this right of war. They're pretty fast with movement eight. So they're getting up the table while still putting down some pretty good firepower to support your army. Now this army does need to get up the table to actually have an impact with all of that close range firepower. So having some long range shooting to provide cover while your transports surge forward would be pretty handy and also to sit back and hold some home objectives. But this army is already so points heavy that you may not get the opportunity. You may not be able to afford it. But if you did, I'd go missile launchers or, or las cannons most efficiently subdue the enemy's own anti-firepower, anti-armor firepower, I should say, whether it's infantry or, or vehicle-based. So get some get some heavy weapons in there if you can uh, if you can afford them on the points and what kind of points you're playing at. So look, that's the Covenant of Fire, Right of War. It's classic Salamanders action, all of the flames, Terminators involved. Next up is their other Right of War, and it's called the Awakening Fire. And it starts to get into this really dark, post Isfan 5 narrative as the sons of Vulcan turn to the Promethean cult and forbidden faith to uh, overcome their grief. Now this, it just gets me interested. I'm super into it. So what are the pro, uh, let's, let's read it out. So the effects, all models with both the infantry unit type and the Legion Legiones as starters salamanders in a unit selected in part of a detachment using this right of war may be given fear one special rule for 20 points per unit. Next up, all models with both the infantry unit subtype and the Salamander special rule in a detachment, blah, blah, blah. Ignore all modifiers to their leadership when making pinning tests. Next up, all models in this detachment uh, and our psychers may choose to have the fury of the Salamander discipline instead of any other discipline. And a detachment using this right of war gains a single additional non-compulsory HQ choice, which may only be used to select a Legion Centurion with the Chaplain console upgrade. He's the one, he's the one spurting all that faith nonsense. Good stuff. All right, limitations. Uh, let's see, you can only have, I'll just, I'll just paraphrase. You can only have one cavalry unit type and you can't include anything with a jump pack. Brutal. And a detachment using this right of war must include a Chaplain console upgrade. And lastly, it can't have Vulcan in it. He is kind of dead, but also kind of not dead, but we won't go into that. So what are the pros? Fear. This is this this right of war, all about fear, giving fear to all of your infantry units. Going to be really powerful in second edition as a special rule. It's a bubble. It's a bubble of negative leadership, essentially. Now with marine leadership being lower across the board, rerolls harder to come by, and pinning being super important to shut down reactions, a minus one to leadership is not insignificant. However, I'm a little disappointed and here's a bit of a con. You have to pay 20 points per unit to get it. If you give that to just, you know, four or five of your infantry units, that's taken up a big chunk of points for something that may come into effect, but also may not. So I'm pretty disappointed. You have to pay points for it. Seems unnecessary, but it is what it is. Now, ignoring all modifiers to leadership sounds good until you realize it's only for pinning. So that second bit of the right of war, also not that exciting. Uh, now, this right of war is how you can access Fury of the Salamandic Psychic Power Discipline. So this I'm excited about. It's got that super tasty power that applies that 18 inch bubble that I read out before of difficult and dangerous terrain to the enemy. Now with the caveat that I obviously have not yet seen it in action, I'm still gonna go and say that this psychic power is absolutely going to frustrate assault based armies. Unfortunately, it's also going to be almost useless against shooting armies. So keep that in mind. I th there's good things in here, but they all have a bit of a butt attached to them. Uh, the next piece, you get a non-compulsory HQ slot. Sure, for a chaplain, great. So what are the cons? Now, first up, you have to take a chaplain, but I actually see this is kind of cool. Chaplains 
Chaplains seem really good. So having an excuse to take one for a nice fluffy reason is, is really nice. Not much of a con at all. Sign me up. I'm into it, especially with that free slot. Better than a boring old Legion champion that, uh, that the Covenant of Fire has to take. So that's that. Now, only one cavalry unit uh, talks to the point I made earlier in the video where salamanders just don't get to enjoy jet bikes and land speeders, which is a shame from a rules point of view because they're pretty tough in this army. But it makes sense narratively. As the stoic salamanders, they're just not into that sort of fast-paced nonsense. Same, same. No units with jump pack. Not even one. Real shame because assault squads that cause fear and automatic pinning checks when deep striking. Mmm, tasty stuff. But look, narratively, salamanders aren't into it. If that's what you're about, you're going to have to look at night lords, I believe. But they're not, they're not coming up for a while. Lastly, uh, you can't take Vulcan. Uh, the narrative strikes again. I get it. Bit of a shame because Primarchs are fun. But if you want this right of war, Vulcan has, has been taken out and, and is hanging out with uh, Kurz, I want to say. Is that who he's hanging out with? Uh, what's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty sure he's getting tortured. He's busy. He's busy getting tortured right now. He can't join your Awakening Fire army. So what are the impacts here? So many limitations and a lack of flashy rules will make this a rather unpopular right of war, I expect. Fear is a really nice rule, but having to pay 20 points for it is not that nice. And not being able to take it on a bunch of deep striking units that I usually want to take in this army is kind of frustrating. The narrative is really cool here, but I think they've let it cripple the army building potential. If I were to build this right of war, uh, that army goes really close combat heavy, supported by a significant artillery force to pin the enemy as I charge in. Pinning, super important. Uh, you mainly, mainly because it's taking advantage of that fear bubble that you're handing out with your infantry that are about to charge in, seeing as we can't get it from deep striking. Now I'm predominantly picking terminators for those close combat units where I can and where I've got the four sword slots as they can take advantage of the salamanders that will not die special rule and other close combat options such as the spoilers depart the narrative and also can't, right? One wound infantry, not for me, not for salamanders. You want those two wounds so you get those chances for the it will not die throughout the game, which are going to stack up. Now, once again, land raiders are going to be your best friend. So you have protection getting up the table and can assault on the turn that you disembark. Not all vehicles are, of course, assault vehicles in Horus Heresy. So those land raiders that are assault vehicles, and not all are, it should be noted, are the ones you're going to want to take. Dreadnoughts do the same job they always do, so keep them in mind, as ever. They punch stuff, they shoot stuff, they're tough in this army, so they're great. For my compulsory troops choices, a couple of meaty tactical squads to hold objectives and, and pick off those screening units will really come in handy. Taking a unit of 15 or 20 will make them unpleasant to shift, either by shooting or assault. So you don't have to worry about your midfield while you crash forward to hit things with hammers and power fists. You've got your chaplain, uh, but you're going to need to take a Praetor uh, as well. So a defensive Praetor is probably the way I want to go here to be a Warlord. Uh, and chuck it in with those unit of, unit of Terminators to make sure that enemy characters striking first aren't going to kill a bunch of them before they get to get in there with their power fists. So there you have it. Those are the two Salamander Rites of Wars, one for flaming, one for punching. That's how I'd be building them out. Both are pretty restrictive in their builds and potentially not actually the way I want to run a Salamander's army, but both are fun and will have their uses. A reminder to check out the core Rites of War to see if they're more suited to the army you want to build. And if you want to include a bunch more units, that's probably the way and, and more varied units including jet bikes and, and land speeders, which as salamanders are kind of cool, that's probably the way you want to go. Core rights of war, check them out. Now, unfortunately, there's nothing overly impactful from a warlord's characters or advanced reaction perspective for the salamanders, though it should be noted that their advanced reaction further pushes that short-ranged defensive build I discussed earlier, giving a number of close combat theme benefits to a unit being charged. Now, what I really want to see in the future is some black shield rules that have flavorful characters for the salamanders and, and iron hands and raven guard sure but that's not what we're talking about here i want to see some unique army builds for those black shields that i can get really excited about for my salamanders we'll just have to wait and see word bearers they're quite unique among the legions in that they embrace demons of chaos in a way that no one else does at least not in the early stages of, of the early to mid heresy era they're slinging Corrupted psychic powers, they've got demon warped marines wrecking face, they've got demons fighting along beside them, and they're just generally evil. Which makes for some great characters, conversion potential, and narrative builds for your armies. So, 
Let's get into it. Boxed set. The box set is great for a Werebearers army who want to take advantage of their leadership shenanigans and various upgrades by taking larger units. 40 Mark VI Werebearers, taken in two tactical squad units, each 20 strong, is a great basis for an army. I would upgrade each of these with dark channeling, giving them the corrupted unit subtype. This is a real game changer for the Werebearers, and I'll quickly read them out. So dark channeling, essentially uh, units with traitor allegiance and the infantry or dreadna dreadnought unit type, as well as the Werebearer special rule, can be given dark channeling for 25 points. They then gain the corrupted unit subtype. Now, models with the corrupted unit subtype are subject to the following rules and restrictions. All models with the corrupted unit subtype gain fear one special rule, any hits inflicted on them by force or psychic focus special powers gain the instant death special rule. Any unit composed entirely of models with corrupted unit subtype is immune to the effects of fear special rule, automatically passes regroup tests, and cannot choose to fail a morale check due to our weapons a useless special rule. When a unit composed entirely of models with corrupted unit subtype fails a morale check, it does not fall back as per the standard rules but instead suffers D3 automatic wounds with no saves or damage mitigation rolls of any kind. No model that does not have the corrupted unit subtype or the demon unit type may join a unit that includes one or more models with the corrupted unit subtype. Two things here, fear, good. We've discussed that previously. Essentially, it's a bubble where you minus the enemy's leadership by one. Uh, that comes into effect with lots of different ways with the Boer Bearers that we'll get into later. And secondly, what is much spicier is the not failing morale checks piece and just taking a couple of wounds, uh, D3 to be specific. Instead, this is so good. And that's why you want those big 20 unit tactical squads of the Boer Bearers to soak up those wounds instead of falling back. So these units are going to be super hard to shift able to soak up wounds from the enemy instead of retreating. I'd be kidding this unit out with chain bayonets because, for the most part, word bearers want to be in assault with various buffs from a multitude of sources across the army. I'd honestly be interested in getting my hands on another 10 basic marines, Mark VI of course being cheap and easy to come by at the moment, to field as legion tactical support squads, or a squad, uh, with warp fire blasters. Now this is a word bearers upgrade for plasma guns, which is just so much better. So it gives the weapon assault two, it gives it pinning, uh, it still keeps that 24 inch range, which is amazing at assault two, and it removes get hot. Yes, please. I think these are fantastic. Now, when it comes to the terminators, I can see myself using five of the catafry, cataphracti, there we go, terminators as a command squad, which is really tempting for word bearers if you're planning on taking their Primarch Lorgar. This is because Lorgar, through the power of the word special rule, can give a command squad, and it's not just the, the cataphracti ones here, they can do it for, he can do it for Tartarus and for just regular Legion command squads as well. He gives them Fearless and the Feel No Pain 4 plus special rule, making them super, super tough. Now, you could get busy with some pretty awesome conversion work on these guys and make a particularly chaosy looking standard bearer if you're taking them as that command squad, which is really nice and always fun. The other five cataphracti could then potentially support your tactical squads as they stomp their way up the battlefield. You could maybe give them an auto cannon to lay down some covering fire or possibly leave them at home if you don't have the points. Giving Lorgar and his command squad a Spartan to get them up the table seems like a pretty decent option as there's not many other great ways to deliver a Primarch on foot. But word bearers are generally an expensive army points wise depending on how you build them out, and honestly, it all comes down to how many Galvor back you're keen on. If the answer's lots, then you might not have the points for a Spartan. So the big old Spartan might not make it into all Wordbearers lists, but having it as an option is always handy. Wordbearers are big on close combat, and so are Dreadnoughts, so you may as well bring one along. Now you can either go down the Corrupted Light version and give it Dark Channeling for just 25 points to cause fear, or go full corrupted and convert your box set contemptor into a Maragal Dreadnought with the addition of some chaosy bits. I reckon I'd go down this path just for flavor, if nothing else. And to be clear, there are a lot of bonus stats and rules this Word Bearers Dreadnought gets. My advice would be to check out the 40k Hellbrute and see what bits you can use from that kit to Maragal, Maragal your Dreadnought up. The War Bearers have so many wonderful characters and Praetor miniatures that it almost seems a shame to use the Praetors out of the box set. 
I'd put these aside and check out Forge World for a suitably corrupted leader to take your force into battle against the Emperor's lapdogs. So, Praetors, not so much. Not going to use them. Now, with that covered, let's have a chat about the Word Bearers' special rules. The Word Bearers have plenty of unique rules going for them. We've already discussed Dark Channeling and their unique Plasma Weapons. Less interesting is their Legion special rule, which I think falls a bit flat, but it's not nothing, so let's have a look at it. The Legion special rule is called True Believers. It reads, A model with this special rule may never have its leadership characteristic modified below a value of 6. Furthermore, if one or more models with this special rule are part of a combat that results in a draw, then a side that includes one or more models at the end of the fight subphase with this special rule is counting as having won the combat by one point. Now, if they're both word bearers, then the combat remains a draw. So that's that. Essentially, you're always going to be passing leadership checks or morale checks on six. And if the combat's a draw, you win by one. Now, this rule obviously benefits a close combat army, but I certainly wouldn't be building around it. Word bearers' unique units and their characters are far more influential in list building than their Legion special rule. So let's take a quick look at these word bearer units. First up is the Galvor back, or known in cultures as the Blessed Sons. Now, these are marines possessed by the creatures of the warp. These guys continue to be fantastic from the last edition. They have amazing miniatures. Just quickly looking at their rules, uh, essentially super tough marines. They've got better movement, better weapon skill, better strength, better toughness. They've got three wounds. They've got initiative five, three attacks each. Super, super tough. Uh, they've got rage two, so they're getting two attacks on the charge. They're relentless, so they're firing their bolt spitters better, which are just kind of like bolters, but we think they're better. They look kind of the same at the moment. Don't know what that's about. We'll, we'll wait and see. Um, let's see, they come in units of five, so they're, you know, that's, that's 15 wounds in a unit right from the start. They've got feel no pain as well. They're just, they're really good. Uh, so that's the Galvor back. Now, the next unit for the Word Bearers is the Ashen Circle Squad. Really interesting unit on the table. They've got both hand flamers and they've got these cool AP3 axes, which have shred. So nice. Now, for only eight points more than an assault marine, you're getting a lot of extra stuff. You're getting, let's see, extra attacks. You're getting extra leadership here. You're getting melter bombs on your unit. What else have we got? We've got the hand flamer and that axe that we talked about before. They're stubborn which is really nice. They have the Crusader special rule. There's extra stuff. I could keep going. I don't need to. Essentially, really great and beefed up Assault Squad is, is what we're looking at here. Better weapons, better stats, really nice unit. Now, these two units, combined with the Maragal Dreadnought we previously mentioned, and supported by various close combat buffs from a variety of sources, make for a very close combat focused army. You couldn't really go wrong with the box set and then just adding each one of these units as a starting point for an army, knowing that your elite force org slots are now filling up super fast. So chuck in a word bearer's character that suits your fancy and you've just got yourself a decent army. But look, is one unit of Galvor back really enough? No, the answer is no, it's not. Luckily, there's a right of war that has us covered. So let's have a look at them now. The word bearers have two very interesting rights of war. There's the Dark Brethren and the Last of the Serrated Sun. We're going to start with Last of the Serrated Sun while we're on the topic of everyone's favorite half demons, half marines. The effects of this right of war. So, Galvorvac squads may be taken as troops. All of the Galvorvac squads in a detachment using this right of war can take Legion Dreadcord drop pods, hard to say, as a dedicated transport. And lastly, any unit that is made up entirely of infantry that has access to a Legion Rhino transport as a dedicated transport, can instead take a Legion drop pod as a dedicated transport. That is that is really nice. Now the limitations here, uh, you can't include any units with a movement characteristic of zero, except for your drop pods, or any units with the artillery unit subtype, sure. Uh, an army whose primary detachment is using this right of war may not take an allied detachment. It cannot be used as an allied detachment. And any army that includes a detachment using this right of war must have the traitor allegiance. And that is for both. The word bearers right of war i might add because they're super evil super evil guys so what are the pros here uh more galvor back equals more awesomeness full stop they're great no more needs to be said now being able to put them in a dreadclaw drop pod as a dedicated transport it's kind of cute but with the high points cost and the inability to assault out of that drop pod i think i'm going to skip that option 
Uh, now, the third part of the Rite of War here, being able to take drop pods as dedicated transport for all infantry units that can take Legion Rhinos, is actually what gets me really interested here. Uh, it's particularly because this Rite of War doesn't have the intense deployment and list building restrictions that the core drop pod assault Rite of War has. Uh, it's really nice. So you can build a, quite a balanced army here, but still have some cool drop pod stuff happening with a bunch of different units that you might not otherwise. So if you're interested in taking half of your army in drop pods, but still having boots on the ground at the start of the game, this is a really nice Rite of War, and word bearers will win quite a few fans from this alone. Cons, as we looked before, the no artillery restrictions uh, doesn't really bother me, that's fine. Uh, whatever, who wants to take detachments? Uh, detachments as well, I've got Galvor back to spend a lot of points on here. Uh, a fully kitted out squad is like 500 points. So you're not going to have the points to take detachments anyway. So that's absolutely fine. Limitations, not so bad. Now, what are the impacts? This is not a complex army to build. You take two to three units of Galvor back. Galvor back are great, and that you can still give them special weapons like melter guns, warp fire blasters, and more powerful close combat weapons like power fists and power axes in case you meet two plus armor saves. In the end though, what these guys excel at is charging your basic three plus Marines. So except for maybe a couple of melter guns for that clutch rhino destruction before charging in, I'd leave the extra options at home. With movement eight and initiative five, not to mention a whole bunch of resilience, I don't think you need transports for these units, which is handy because they get pretty expensive. Now, to take advantage of the right's drop pod action and soften up units that your Galvor back may struggle with, I'd be looking at a couple of tactical support squads in drop pods armed with melter guns and warp fire blasters to drop down into my enemy's lines. I want to fill the rest of this army out with those units from the box set, and then you're pretty much good to go. Those, are, those tactical squads in particular are pretty vital, so you can hold objectives. The Spartan and the Terminators, you can maybe leave at home if you're running out of points. Uh, it's very unlikely you can fit Lorgar into this list, so when we're talking about who's gonna lead this detachment, I'm looking straight at Argyl Tal. Uh, he's almost 200 points cheaper than Lorgar, and he buffs the unit of Galvor back he joins. He's my premier option if you're doing Last of the Serrated Sun, Rite of War. Plus his model is so nice. It is amazing. Uh, once again, he's gonna struggle against enemy with a two plus armor save. So taking out those high toughness save units with your support squads is pretty vital. Now, if you're looking for a more balanced word bearers force and one that is more likely to be able to fit Lorgar into its ranks, then the Dark Brethren may be the way to go. It reads, effects. Now, look, I'm <laughs> I take that back. I am not gonna read through all of this. It's ridiculous. Essentially, uh, you pick an enemy unit. If you destroy that unit, you get what's called a favor point, you know, favor of the dark gods, if you will, point. Uh, and that gives you plus one strength, plus one movement, and plus one weapon skill to one of your units. Uh, you can stack that three time, or you can spread it across different units. Once you've destroyed that enemy unit, you then get to choose a different enemy unit to sacrifice, and you, you go again, you destroy it, you get another point. And that just repeats. Now the limitations here, if you don't manage to do a wound or hull point uh, of damage to that sacrifice unit that you've chosen for the enemy, you start taking Perils of the Warp for random units of yours uh, in a turn. Uh, lastly, it has to be traitors. So that's the gist. Uh, feel free to go and check it out for yourself and read through it, but it is pretty wordy. So what are the pros here? Killing the enemy seems like something you want to do in games of Horus Heresy. Uh, getting lasting buffs for it seems like a really nice bonus. Notably, you don't have to give the strength, movement, and weapon skill buff to the unit that killed the sacrifice unit. So I'm seeing scenarios where you choose a rhino as your sacrificial unit of the enemies, you take it out with a heavy support squad armed with missile launchers, and then you hand off your favor of the dark gods, point to your unit of Ashen Circle or Galvor back who are about to charge into assault. Really nice, works really nicely. Weapon skill is such a big deal in this edition of Horus Heresy. So this rule can really give you the edge in combat. Being able to stack it or spread it amongst different units is also really nice and to be able to do what you need with it at the time. It's really flexible. Now the cons, if you don't manage to cause any damage, uh, you're in trouble, but look, that seems kind of fair. No pact with the dark gods comes without risk. So I'm very okay with this and I love the narrative of the rule. Being a traitor just makes sense. Don't even need to say that's a con. Now, what's the impact for the army? Uh, pretty substantial here. So essentially you get to build this army any way you want, which is quite refreshing for a Legion Rite of War. 
there's no, there's no big restrictions on units or, or ones you particularly want to take. I think the key to this army will be making a balanced list that is able to remove enemy units in every turn of the game. Now, there's lots of ways you can do that, uh, but I think some strong long range shooting will make sure you've earned yourself a couple points of favor in time for your close combat units to reach your opponent's lines. You also want to make sure you're going with quantity over quality in the way you build your units and this army. Expensive elite units who are already deleting whatever they charge will benefit far less from favor points than big 20 strong units of basic Marines. So step one, I think Logar and a command squad is a great way to start off this army build for this right of war. I'm tempted to actually run most of this army on foot and in particular Logar and his command squad as I don't wanna be losing killing power by investing points into expensive transports that are busy moving forward and not shooting. The Spartan, great example. If you're moving that all the way forward, you're not shooting its you know, ridiculous amounts of las cannon shots. So we're gonna skip the land raiders in this situation. There doesn't seem to be a restriction on cataphry cataphracti terminators running in this edition, uh, just restrictions around their sweeping advances, though please correct me in the comments if I'm wrong on that one. So you're not losing out on too much movement by going with the cataphracti as the command retinue uh, option. The four plus invulnerable save is probably going to be worth the one pip of movement you lose over Tartarus terminators. It's going to cop a lot of firepower this unit with Logar on the Terminators. So having it with Fearless and Feel No Pain 4 Plus from Logar means it can soak up a bunch of hits. Next up, I want big units of basic Marines that are going to really benefit from that favor bonus. 20 strong units of despoiler squads and assault squads would be my preference here. Uh, as long as they can see Logar with his Sire of the Word Bearers Warlord trait, letting them use his leadership, I'm not too stressed about them failing morale or pinning checks on their way across the table. I want to give these big units dark channeling and the corrupted subtype, but at the same time, I think giving them apothecary would be pretty good. And I think the feel no pain five plus is going to really come in handy. It's a bit of a toss up. You can really go either way, but I think you gain more from having an apothecary in each of these big units than you do giving them corrupted, especially as they're already getting leadership bonus from Logar. Now, if you're not taking Logar and we talk about some of the other characters soon, uh, going down the corrupted route, probably the better way to go. Finally, it's going to be important to include some long range firepower that I've discussed before. Now, without any transports kicking around, I'm naturally drawn to infantry to fulfill this role to further diminish the enemy's anti-armor firepower. And you get a bit more bang for your buck in terms of raw shots from heavy support squads over tanks. Though the argument could just as equally be made to take a bunch of Predators, Vindicators, Sakarans to draw that heavy firepower away from Logar and his command squad. Vehicles also let you take searchlights and give you a bit more maneuverability when getting line of sight onto enemy units attempting to hide. If you do go down the infantry route though, I don't think you can just rely on long range firepower due to the prevalence and impact of night fighting in this game, hence those searchlights that I mentioned before. Luckily, the warp fire blasters we discussed uh, have a 24 inch range and assault two, perfect for this role of deleting units in the midfield while still in those early turns of night fighting. I think I'd take two units of heavy support squads in this army, both with full 10 Marines if you can afford it points wise, one kitted out entirely with las cannons and the other with either missile launchers or maybe plasma cannons if you're, if you're drawn down that way. Knowing that I'm pretty sure plasma cannons can be updated, upgraded, I should say, with, uh, with that word bearer's special plasma rule as well. Uh, then I'd take a tactical support squad with those warp fire blasters. Now, this should ensure that you're racking up favor in turns one and two, while softening up the enemy for those big charges of units that have just been benefited from the points you've earned. On top of these units, if you've got the points left, you can't go wrong with Dreadnoughts and a bit more Galvor back. They're just, they're just so fun. It's, it just doesn't seem like a Wordbearers army without them. And there we have it. That is the Wordbearers two rights of war and respective army builds. Very different looking armies, but both geared towards getting into combat and chopping up your enemy. A reminder, however, to check out the core rights of war to see if they better suit the army that you might want to build if neither of these sound that tempting to you. Now, let's look at Warlord Trade's characters and the Warbearer's advanced reaction. The Warbearer Warlord Traits are predominantly focused on buffs to some close combat action, either for the Warlord himself or for units they've joined. Most interestingly is the unswerving dev voting devotion, I dare say, Warlord Trait, that lets you ignore the first morale or pinning check 
you fail each turn for units within six inches of your Warlord. Well, it's not that sexy or exciting, that kind of reliability is really tempting, and this would probably be my go-to if I'm not running a Wordbearer's character. We've already talked about Lorgar and Argol Tal, uh, but the Wordbearers also have access to a bunch of other characters. So they've got Zadu Leak, High Chaplain Erebus, and Corferon. Now, just quickly on Lorgar, before I get into those others, if you're going his transfigured form, you know, he's gone full evil by this stage, he can actually fill out non-compulsory Force Org slots with units from the Ruinstorm Demon Army list. I'm not going to speak to this any further and I'm not going to talk about what that army might look like as we don't currently have those rules. But having access to an entire other army list full of demony goodness within the same detachment has to be a pretty powerful option. So keep that in mind and keep your eye out for when we finally get those demon rules. Erebus, the High Chaplain, for far less points, can select some demons of his own to include in a Warbearer's army though only three units and they have to be either HQ or elite options. So poor man's option there, but if you want some demons, don't want to go full Lorgar, Erebus is your man. Now, if you've selected a Zaduleak, the Crimson Apostle as your warlord, then you're going to want to ensure you're bringing along units of corrupted infantry to give his plus one strength and plus one movement bonus to. The Dark Brethren we talked about before, I was pretty keen to give them Apothecaries, uh, but if you're bringing Leic, I'd, uh, I'd go with Corrupted, big units of Corrupted Infantry. The risk of suffering Perils of the Warp each turn, and that's part of his special rule, uh, means that you're going to want to select cheap units to bless with this Cursed Gift, or units that have def decent, invulnerable saves to shrug the wounds off. Zadu could work very well, uh, as I said, in that Dark Brethren Rite of War army, choosing the Corrupted option over the Apothecaries. Finally, a Corferon, the Priest King of Colchis. I just, I love these titles. Uh, Corferon, he's, he's kind of the budget option. He's handing out, he's doing, he's doing some really cool stuff though. So he's cheap, uh, he's only 125 points. And what he does is hand out pinning to enemy units around him like it's no one's business. So he gets to do a couple of things um, each turn, one of, one of two, I should say. And one of them is that to all enemy units within 12 inches, they have to take a pinning test. Now, naturally, you want to match him with fear-causing corrupted units, take advantage of the pinning on the charge without worrying about those pesky Overwatch reactions. Love it. There's some real synergy here. So I think if you're going down the budget option, you're not interested in Lorgar, chucking this guy into your Dark Brethren Rite of War could really be the way to go. Uh, plus the strength bonus he might get from a favor of the Dark Gods point or two would be really nice because he's only strength three, not being a not being a proper post-human, just one of those one of those weaker ones done of grown men. So that's Corferon. I think he's really great. That pinning thing is is really potentially powerful. I think pinning's super important in this edition, so have a good look at him. While the word bearer's advanced reaction may not necessarily impact army building. The ability to sacrifice a single model and then ignore the remainder of an enemy unit's shooting attack is going to be another nice tool to protect your infantry as they charge across the table into close combat. In particular, I like this for Lorgar and whatever red new he's rolling with. It does however encourage bigger squads of weaker infantry as sacrificing an assault marine hurts far less than sacrificing a terminator or a galvor back. So just keep that in mind. I think Warbearers really gain a lot from having big units of cheap marines. Now, Sons of Horus, the poster children for what a legion should be. They are aggressive, they're tough, they are covered in spikes. These guys are brutal, and your army will reflect this. The Sons of Horus army favors infantry, and that infantry fighting up close and dirty. If you like Terminators especially, this legion is for you. So, let's get into it. First up is the box set. You can't go wrong with the box set when it comes to the Sons of Horus. They're keen on all that infantry, and in particular, those 10 Cataphracti Terminators. 40 Mark VI Marines makes for a really good backbone for the rest of the army, and can be used in a multitude of squads. While it would be nice to be able to kit them out as despoilers, getting your hands on all those heresy-appropriate close combat weapons and pistols isn't currently easy. Luckily, the new chain bayonets will do in a pinch, and make sure that your tactical squads are still doing what Sons of Horus want to be doing, which is causing mayhem in close combat. Any Sons of Horus army will benefit from tactical or heavy sports squads of various kinds, so it really just comes down to taste. With so much elite infantry in this army, I'd be gearing my sports squads up for killing either tanks with las cannons or missiles, or multitudes of weaker infantry with heavy bolters, rotor cannons, or Volkite weaponry. 
This, uh, this weak infantry, while it's not currently supported, we will see army books in the future for Imperial armies and militia that your elite infantry might struggle to chop through all those bodies. If you're a Terminator fan, the Sons of Horus are your legion, both due to their special rule and a particular right of war that we'll get into a bit later. Needless to say, they will put the 10 Cataphracti Terminators in this box to excellent use. If you're going down the Terminator heavy route, there's worse things you could do than even grabbing another 10 of these Cataphracto Terminators, while box splits are plentiful and competitively priced. While the Forge World Justarian Terminators look great, a few top knots from 40k Space Marines, for instance, uh, 40k Chaos Space Marines, you could get some, and some cheeky spiky bits that you can make easily enough from various methods, will turn your generic Cataphracto Terminators into these elite lads very easily. Terminators, especially of the Cataphracti nature, generally need transports. Even if a certain right of war and its outflanking shenanigans is chosen, coming onto the battlefield in a transport gives you so much more protection and reach, even if you can't then assault on that turn. So a Spartan is almost a must for a Sons of Horus army, and this box set has you sorted. Sons of Horus Dreadnoughts are particularly terrifying in close combat, so the box set Contemptor is a must-have, and I don't think Sons of Horus players will stop at just one. Imagine managing to get your hands on a second Dreadnought Power Fist, maybe swapping with a mate who's going to double up on auto cannons or such, uh, would be worthwhile for that extra attack. I'm really interested in how we're going to get our hands on Dreadnought weapons. Um, there's lots of extra weapons in the box, for instance, but I'm pretty convinced there's this extra little little shoulder bit that you need to use on all the Legion-specific Dreadnoughts, for instance. So I'm waiting to see what the solution is for that across the community and, and how we do it. Uh, 3D printing might be the answer to that, and that's absolutely fine too. The Praetors work just fine for a Sons of Horus army, in particular that axe-wielding monster. He's got deep Chthonian vibes and would be great as a Praetor or any number of consoles in a Sons of Horus army. Uh, for one of the 16th Legion Rites of War, you need to take a Master of Signals, so sticking some gadgets and antennae on one of those miniatures will definitely do the job. Overall, the box set is a win for Sons of Forest players. Now let's have a chat about their special rules. This special rule is intense. And while I don't think it was the best narrative choice the design team could have made to represent the 16th Legion, it certainly packs a punch. For such an aggressive legion, their legion-wide special rule is actually really defensive. Let's have a quick look at it. It reads, During a turn in which a unit made up entirely of models with the Legiones Astartes Sons of Horus special rule successfully charges, or are successfully charged, the strength of all melee attacks made against any model in that unit does not have, that does not have vehicle type suffers a minus one. Models with the vehicle unit type and this special rule instead inflict an additional 3 hits for a total of 1d6 plus 3, or 2d6 plus 3 if it's a super heavy vehicle, on units composed of models that do not have the vehicle unit type when conducting a ramming attack. This is the kind of rule you build around, people. It's just that good. And it gives Sons of Horus a decent advantage over most other legions in combat. So, who is benefiting from this? Anyone that can fight in close combat, obviously. Infantry, Dreadnoughts, and to a lesser extent, your cavalry units, who just don't crank out quite enough attacks at their points cost to make this really worthwhile for this purpose. Uh, vehicles are getting their RAM bonus, which is not incons inconsequential, I should say. Essentially almost doubling the effectiveness of ramming for this Legion, which is, which is kind of crazy. There's just something so satisfying about a wall of rhinos crushing your enemy as they flee off the table. But the main one here is, is not the ramming, that's just a nice little plus. A big, a big plus though, I kind of think. But the most one here is the minus one strength in close combat. So when looking at those infantry choices, anything with two wounds are definitely the biggest winners here. Why you ask? Well, when it comes down to melee weapons that could be causing instant death, the majority of them are doing so due to being strength eight against your commonplace toughness for marine. Power fists. Chain Fists, Thunder Hammers, and their like are double the regular Marine strength of four, taking it to that really important eight, and instant deathing all of your expensive two-wound infantry. Not so for Sons of Horus. All of your opponent's Power Fists, Chain Fists, and Thunder Hammers, carried by those of Marine-like disposition, and notably in the turn that they charge or are charged, will be striking at strength seven. This is huge. 
It means your two wound infantry are no longer subject to instant death in any turn that you or your opponent charged. To put this into context, in a Terminator on Terminator matchup where you're both swinging with power fists, your Sons of Horus boys are essentially doing twice the amount of damage or, put in another way, are twice as survivable. It also means that any feel no pain mitigation you might have is now not being negated because of course feel no pain special rule can't be taken against instant death weapons. In an addition where I think power fist will be very popular to take out dreadnoughts mostly, uh, specifically because of all the two wound elite infantry as well, this special rule, this special rule is just fantastic. So what are we taking in an army to make sure we're taking best advantage of this? We're taking terminators, we're taking veterans and we're taking characters. Elite Legion infantry, which for the 16th Legion means Reaver attack squads are gonna be great. Uh, next up, we're gonna focus on that feel no pain bonus because we're gonna get them much more often than other legions. So apothecaries are the obvious choice who are naturally drawn to bigger units to get bang for your buck. So we're talking about big squads of despoilers, assault squads and Reaver attack squads all benefit greatly from this extra damage mitigation at least in close combat, where we're of course not negating instant death from shooting, but hey, better than nothing. Throw a couple of Dreadnoughts into the mix, who very much enjoy only being wounded by Power Fist on a 4+, plus, and we're starting to see an army form. So what do the Rites of War bring to the table for the Sons of Horus? Let's take a look. The Sons of Horus have two very straightforward Rites of War. We've got their Black Reaving and the Long March. One Rite of War likes Terminators, and the other likes Reavers. And and Terminators. First up, the Black Reaving. It reads, models with the Sons of Horus special rule taken as part of a detachment using this right of war gain the Rage 2 special rule when they successfully charge an enemy unit which is already locked in combat with one or more units or an enemy unit that is the target of at least one other charge in the same charge subphase. So essentially you're getting uh, an extra attack on top of the extra attack you would normally get when you charge into close combat as long as that enemy unit is already engaged with one of your units. Reaver attack squads may be chosen as troop choices for detachments using this right of war and when chosen as troop choices gain the line unit subtype. So important, very important, really great here. And lastly, just because just you need it a little bit more, Justeran Terminators chosen as part of a detachment using this right of war gain the Deep Strike special rule. Okay, limitations. Uh, essentially, you've got to take a Master of Signal. Sure. And you have to have more fast attack choices than heavy support choices. So what are the pros here? Sons of Horus like combat. The Black Reaving gives you an extra attack when you charge into combat. It's a match made in the shredded meat of your enemies. Attacks aren't exactly a dime a dozen in Heresy, so getting a cheeky extra one for your entire army when charging in seems pretty good. Noting, of course, when it only kicks off when you charge into an enemy that's already engaged with one of your units, but there's ways we'll build this into our army. We've already talked about how much we love two wind infantry for the Sons of Horus. Well, now you get to take them as troops choices in the form of your Reaver attack squads, and much more importantly, they get the line subtype. Big deal, big deal, people. Not all rights of war are generous enough to do this. Uh, just look at the Dark Angel rights of war, for instance, the many that they have, and the absolute lack of the line subtype uh, throughout all of them. So getting that line piece is really nice. And just for that little cherry on top, the Just There and Terminators getting Deep Strike, very nice. We know Deep Striking is going to be fantastic in this edition, as long as you're planning around it, uh, with the ability to pin enemy units and then charge into combat on the turn you arrive. So having it on such a slow but choppy unit, really nice. What are the cons here? Um, having to take a Masters of Signal is a bit of a pain. Why is this, you might ask? And I think quite a few people have missed this. Yes, he does cool reserve things. Uh, yes, he makes your units braver. He helps you shoot better. He's just an all round great guy. Well, yes and no. He also comes with this pesky Vox Disruptor array, which is super powerful, but potentially making your opponent's deep strike assault disordered, but also just as likely to make your own deep strike assault disordered. That's on a one, two or three. Suddenly after your first unit deep striking, the rest of the units are potentially disordered. Now we just got super excited about just Aaron Terminators deep striking. So how do we get around this? Well, this is my advice. If you only take a single unit to deep strike, you make sure your assault can't be disordered and you get around the negative side effects. 
which I assume is what the design is intended here. So you take a single big unit of these spiky guys, you can take up to 12 just Darren in a squad, if you're, if you're feeling particularly obnoxious, and you just leave it at that, that's it. The, the one squad, you can chuck a character in there as well because it still counts as the, the one squad, they can't be disordered. So that's that. Um, the fast attack over heavy sport, it's workable, it's not a big deal. It, worst case scenario, if you wanna open up those heavy sport slots, you just get a bunch of cheap land, land speeders, right? Just chuck them in. So the world's not ending. There are a lot of impacts for army building on this one, so it's quite in depth. This Rite of War is doing a lot of what we've already discussed around the Sons of Horus. They've got big units of close combat monsters, the obvious choice here being Reaver attack squads, especially because you can take them in squads of 20. They're such a flexible unit, and to have them in the troops with the line subtype makes them really worth taking, whereas as an elite choice, they're a bit meh. At least two big units of these guys, I think that's a must, Three feels better. I wanna kit them out, uh, mostly with close combat options, but kit them out how you like. I think leaving the expensive shooting stuff behind in this Rite of War is, is the better choice because you're gonna wanna be running uh, when you're not close enough to the enemy to assault. Now to support these units, I'd go straight to an Apothecarian detachment, putting one in each of these squads. As I said before, you're going to be getting feel no pain in close combat more often than not, uh, mainly because you won't be subject to instant death nearly as much as other Marines might be. You could go either way with transports. There's certainly merit to taking various types of land raiders to deliver these squads, but this is a lot of points, especially because if you want to take a unit of 20 with a character, it has to be a Spartan that's carrying them. And that thing costs a lot. So it's already a pretty elite army. I think I'm gonna leave the land raiders at home and rely on those two wounds, horde-like numbers, and the feel no pain saves to see the ravers safely across the table. We've already talked about a big single unit of Just Air and Terminators. Take as many as you want, up to 12, and hold them in reserve to deep strike. Taking the Sons of Horus Primarch Lupercal in this Rite of War works just fine, and you could do a lot worse than putting him in deep strike with those Terminators. He has deep strike natively, so he's good to go. Now this might seem like overkill, but you can always split him off from the unit in subsequent turns. Horus is expensive though, so if you don't have the points for him, Abaddon is a great alternative and packs a mean punch. Um, he does actually give a unit deep strike, so I feel like we're missing out on something there because we're, we've already got it. But you know what? That's fine. It's nice and fluffy, hangs out with his Just Aaron, has a great time. As the Terminators and character are deep striking as a single squad, it doesn't cause any issues with the potential for a disordered deep strike assault that we discussed earlier with that Masters of Signal. Now you remember that the rage bonus of the Rite of War only goes off if you're charging a unit that is already engaged. So for each Reaver squad, I would also take a 10 man squad of cheap, basic assault marines. These guys support their respective Reaver squads by jumping into assault beforehand, soaking up overwatch, and making sure your Reavers are getting access to that sweet rage special rule. You'll want a unit for your Masters of Signals to hang out with. Heavy sports squads are always a great choice for this, benefiting the most from his buff to ballistic skill. A squad of 10 LAS cannons gives you the potential to pop those heavy transports so that your Reavers can get to the fleshy contents without any issues in assault. This squad is also good for putting wounds onto enemy contempted dreadnoughts who are still putting instant death onto your two wound infantry with their cheeky strength nine fists. Even after the Sons of Horror special rule kicks in, dreadnoughts are still pretty scary for your, uh, for your two wound infantry. A couple of tactical squads to support your backline and hold midfield objectives is never a bad option. You got chain bayonets on them for sure, if just for the aesthetics, if nothing else. Don't forget they also get rage, not just your Reaver attack squads. So they can definitely still do work in assault, even if they're tactical squads. You can upgrade these guys with Bane Strike Bolters. Um, it gives them, I think, six plus breaching. It's, it's kind of good, I guess, but five points per model gets pretty expensive for a unit that you'd probably rather see in combat. Taking fast attack choices is fine, though harder than it looks in this army, as they aren't great close combat focused fast attack options. And we don't really wanna bring anything that wants to deep strike. So this is only a concern if you've decided to bring some land raiders along for your reavers, and you need to open up those heavy support slots, as reavers don't have land raiders as dedicated transports. I think, uh, great choice here, look, couple of land speeders, Super cheap, right? But I think a really nice option here is some Outriders or Jet Bikes with Melter Guns or Multi Melters, respectively, knowing that they're twin-linked on both of these squads. 
This provides another unit to open up those opponent's transports and to finish off those Dreadnoughts of the Laz Cannon Squad weakened. 10 Laz Cannons will not kill a Contempted Dreadnought, people, as crazy as that sounds. So having these little units to pop in and do those last couple of wounds, super handy. These units can also be used at a pinch to charge in before your Reaver Squads, in case your Sacrificial Assault Squad have copped it while you're, uh, while you're bounding across the battlefield. So that's that. That is the Black Reaving Rite of War. Now, if you're more into Terminators rather than the Reavers, then the Long March is the Rite of War for you. I've seen a bunch of people asking online which Legion does Terminators best, and you could certainly do a lot worse than Sons of Horus running this Rite of, right of War. So, what does it read? Let's see. Units made up entirely of models with Legiones as starting special rule and the infantry or dreadnought unit type that are part of this detachment using this Rite of War gain plus one to their movement characteristics in the movement phase. There's just, there's so many words. I'm going to stop reading it. You get plus one to your movement most of the time. Doesn't impact for charging. Boo. All right, next up, Legion Cataphracto Terminator Squads, Legion Tartarus Terminator Squads, and Justeran Terminators may be chosen as non-compulsory troops in a detachment using this right of war. And lastly, and this is kind of the cool bit, any Legion Cataphracto Terminator Squads, Tartarus Squads, or Justeran Squads selected as troops choices gain outflank. Very nice. Now, for those that don't know what outflank is, go have a read. Essentially, it's a reserve option where you come in from one of the board edges and you get to charge when wa wandering onto the table. Super nice. Um, limited in how far you can move on, especially because Terminators are slow, but you've got that little plus one movement blip. Anyway, let's get into it. Let's get into it. So, honestly, I think this Rite of War is a bit hit or miss. It's like the designers decided having Terminators as, as troops was really huge, so they then went a bit tame on the rest of the benefits. Outflank can be really huge and can be really impactful, but a county opponent is going to shut it down, especially when the outflanking units are slow-moving Terminators. The plus one movement was, I assume, meant to overcome this, but it's not exactly blowing my mind. Sometimes, though, look, it all comes down to an inch, right? So it's better than nothing, and it's going to hopefully get your Terminators a little further where they need to be. As I mentioned, Terminators as, as troops, that's what people are here for. You can take lots, you take them all, but you will then need still compulsory troops that are not Terminators. Can't go, for, can't go full Terminators. Bit disappointing is what it is. Finally, the outflank piece. So if due to the mission, the battlefield, or you're facing an opponent that doesn't really know what to expect, you can definitely get off some serious assault action happening off a cheeky outflank. And when you do... This right of war is going to feel great. If your opponent manages to redeploy or maneuver away from your outflank entry point, and you do have to uh, signify it at the start of the game, it's going to feel significantly less impactful while your Terminators have to stomp their way across the table. But we'll get on to mitigating this as we talk. Now, the con here, you've got to be a trader. Sorry, Loken, this isn't for you. <clears throat> Loken, Loken only does short marches. And no units with the heavy subtype unless they're starting in reserve or in transports. Now, there's actually a lot of units with the heavy subtype. So keep this in mind as you try to build out this right of war. But look, honestly, if you really want a heavy support squad, for instance, with that heavy type in there, or many of the other units, you just chuck them in a, in a rhino, right? 35 point tax, you can still bring them along. What this really impacts is things like Leviathans, for instance. Um, you don't really want your Leviathan in reserves for obvious reasons. It's short ranged. If it comes marching on the table in turn three, it's not going to do that much. So this, this right of war, no Leviathans for you. So what's the impact? What's the impact on army building here? <clears throat> First up, I want to see at least three units of Terminators coming on from outflank to make this right of war really worth it. I want to see one each of Cataphracti, Tartarus, and Just Darren, just because you can. But all these units are going to start tripping over each other while moving onto the battlefield. So taking at least one of them, probably the Just Darren, just because just it makes sense, they get the sweet ride. I want to take the Just Darren in a Spartan to make sure they can move onto the table a little further, try and chase down some opponents if they've tried to move away from your outflank entry, and just so you're not clogging yourself up in that outflank entry zone. Just remember though, they can't assault on the turn they arrive from outflank if they're in a transport. Point for point, Just Darren, they're just fantastic. Outperforming regular Terminators across the board and likely well worth the extra points. So if you choose to go all Just Darren for this army, you could definitely make worse, worse decisions than that. 
Taking Horus in this Rite of War isn't as intuitive as the Black Reaving, as Horus, as far as I'm aware, can't join the Terminators in outflank. So you'd need to dedicate another expensive unit to guard him and another expensive transport to get him into the fight. His army-wide handing out of stab Stubborn is also a lot less impactful here, as Terminators have their pseudo-stubborn effect with the inexorable, inexorable special rule. So Horus, mm, I don't think he belongs in this Rite of War. I actually quite like Malagurst for this Rite of War. Firstly, because his model is just everything I want in a heresy miniature. It's so nice. And secondly, because he does some great objective controlling and leadership buffing while you wait for your outflankers to arrive. I think I put him in a big unit of Reavers to pincer the enemy between these guys and your Terminators. With Mal it also gives those Reavers line, which in this Rite of War, they of course do not have. With Malagurst, this unit can't run, so maybe give them a bunch of plasma guns to lay down some decent firepower while they advance up the table. Another HQ choice I really want in this army is Master of Signals. <laughs> Ironic, because I didn't really want it in the Black Reaving Rite of War. Now, Master of Signals are great in an outflanking army, providing a vital reservary role for units that have to spend a turn or two catching up with the enemy after entering the battlefield. His disruption to dip, Deep Strike here can only hurt your opponent and not you, which is really nice, noting that you could Deep Strike, but you, you won't. Uh, there's a multitude of squads you can pair him with. Uh, something that shoots good is always a better choice, noting that we can't take the heavy sports squad here unless it's in a Rhino, which, which you can do. You can do that, that's fine. Just means first turn, you'll only be snap firing, which kind of sucks. So it defeats the purpose. So put him in put him in something else, maybe some, some tactical support squads. Now, let's be honest, Master of Signals, great choice here, but it's also a pretty safe choice, pretty boring choice, if you will. So if you're feeling a little edgier, looking for something a little spicier, a Legion Librarian can do real work for this army. Now, our center of gravity here revolves around our outflanking Terminators being able to get the jump on enemy units. The enemy, however, has a turn or two to try and get out of the way. So what better way to achieve our aims than to pin the enemy in place? Making sure they're not only within assault range of our outflanking Terminators, but also can't perform some potentially brutal reactions while we march on the board. I'll let you read up on the powers themselves, but the telepathy psychic discipline is out of control. I think it'll be almost an auto include for certain assault based armies, and this one could certainly use the help. I'm keen to flank Malagurst and his Reaver squad that we talked about before with a couple of uh, cheaper despoiler squads to provide some more line troops, because your Terminators, even though they're troops, don't have that line subtype. So we need some more line units to make sure we're getting those objectives. Despoilers are great too, because they are, check out their special rules. They, they actually, they get tougher um, and better when they're near objectives. They also make sure you're getting the most out of Malagurst's, Malagurst's there we go, Legion Standard as well, because he's, he's got that big flag. Make sure you've got some units around to take advantage of it. Finally, a Talon of three Contempted Dreadnoughts runs with this second force, the, the first force being your outflanking Terminators, uh, to really make sure your opponent thinks hard about whether they want to be closer to a bunch of Dreadnoughts or a bunch of Terminators. The plan is to push your opponent into making a bad decision and force them back towards your outflanking entry point if they try to move away. And that is the Sons of Horus, Rites of War. Two distinct ways to build an army, all of it involving running down your opponents, tearing them apart with packs of angry sea green marines. Now, while there's some great characters in the Sons of Horus lineup, most of which I've already mentioned, none of them have any significant impact on army building. Same, same, Warlord traits, which are mostly about turning your characters into unstoppable killing machines. A quick shout out though, to the Dark Emissary, which is the console upgrade for the Sons of Horus. If you're planning on running an allied detachment as part of a trader army, Sons of Horus make for an excellent choice because they can take this console. What it does is make the Sons of Horus allied detachment just completely stubborn, just, the, just a big old stubborn block of, uh, of Sons of Horus. So if you wanna go down a bit of allied detachment rule, uh, you know, rules, methods, ways of building an army, uh, the Dark Emissary and Sons of Horus, great way to go. Thousand Sons, famous for their psychers and flaunting of the Emperor's decrees. The 15th Legion are a real toolbox when it comes to army building, letting you use their Prosperine Arcana rules to provide units with relevant and powerful bonuses. At the risk, of course, of failing a psychic check and blowing their heads up. So, a toolbox that, com toolbox that comes with a healthy dose of risk versus reward. Emphasis on the risk part. 
They're a legion offering a balanced playstyle that can be tailored towards combat or shooting, depending on the whims of the player. Though I'd say they're leaning harder towards the combat side. So let's get into it. First up is a look at the box set. The Thousand Sons are more than happy with the Heresy box set. They can do a bunch of different things with the Mark VI Marines, and there's certainly worse options than just kidding out 40 tactical lads with the Thousand Sons' unique Asphyx bolters and giving them the Athanian Minor Arcana upgrade for a unit that is now re-rolling to wound rolls when shooting with their bolters, which is insane. And the unit they've shot at is at minus one to the leadership for morale checks. Put these squads into a bunch of rhinos, and you have one of the better mechanized armies in the game. I would actually highly recommend Rhinos and other transport for your infantry squads to avoid your sergeants, who are pivotal to your minor arcana powers, getting picked off by the plethora of snipers we're going to see in this edition. You lose your sergeants, you lose your minor arcana upgrades. Now the Asphyx Bolt Rush and, and all the other little tricks this army can pull off when combining its psychic powers, unique weapons and various legion units is what I'm talking about when I use the word toolbox here. You can do some really interesting things with units to give them specialized roles and generally lift their performance. Sticking on the Thousand Suns unique weapon theme, I'd highly recommend giving Tenny Vibikis the either, 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 mm, either fire blasters. I don't really know how to pronounce that word. Uh, I, mm, yep, I'm not even going to try. 18 inch assault two weapons that, while only rending on a six plus, are potentially doing so at strength eight if you pass your psychic check which is that sweet spot for instant death which is it's just becoming so important in this edition these weapons these weapons are really nice i'm really into them check them out any any kind of plasma-ish weapon that gets rid of gets hot is uh is a tick in my box and something i actually want to be putting on marines with the three plus save now the 10 cataphracti terminators that you get in the box set certainly have a place in numerous thousand suns armies though they do unfortunately compete with the amazing looking Sekhmet Terminator Cabal, the 15th unique Terminator unit, just because the models, they're just so good. Now to differentiate the unit, because I want to include both, obviously, uh, I'd always be arming your regular Cataphracti with Power Fists and Chain Fists. The various Minor Arcana are fantastic for Cataphracti Terminators, and how I deploy them would dictate which one I'd choose. If they're going to deep strike with one of the Thousand Suns' ridiculous rites of war, and more on that later, I'd give them the Pyre Minor Arcana for a bunch of Hammer of Wrath attacks when they charge in. If they're going to ride in a transport or leg it up the table, the 3 plus movement they get from the Pavoni Minor Arcana is really handy for these traditionally slower boys. Now, I don't love the Spartan for Thousand Suns. It's a big chunk of points to not be spending on infantry, which is where the Thousand Suns' power really lies. With all, of their, with all of their psychic shenanigans they can do, you really want your infantry and cavalry shining through in this army in the Spartan. It's a bit of a miss. But look, if you're not running that deep strike orientated rut of war that I keep teasing, having a way to get a big combat unit reliably up the table unscathed is always useful. And furthermore, if you're using a Spartan for another unit, let's say a big unit of despoilers, um, really handy for protecting, once again, protecting that sergeant with all the precision shots we're seeing in the game right now. Um, Thousand Suns could really use a strong transport like the Spartan to, uh, to get up the table. So it just depends on what other units you're taking and which, which right of war you're choosing. Now the Dreadnought in the box set is useful for almost every Legion and the Thousand Suns are no exception. Just for flavor and to save a whole lot of money, I'd be tempted to convert the box set Contemptor into a Contemptor Asiren Dreadnought, which is one of the Thousand Suns unique units. Uh, think a Contemptor Dreadnought, but it can cast Psychic Powers, either a Minor Arcana at only 15 extra points or a full-blown Psychic Discipline for 50 points. The latter option seems a bit pricey, so I'd probably stick with the rather uninspiring but solid option of giving your Osiren the Raptora Minor Arcana and upgrading its invulnerable save to a 4+, which you can't do with a regular Dreadnought, because a regular Dreadnought can't take a Minor Arcana. Uh, that 4+, is as long as you're within 12 inches of your opponent, uh, so keep this thing out for close combat. Now, the Praetors aren't great picks for the Thousand Suns, Though I'm sure they can be converted up to represent various consoles you might choose to run. Um, good example is a Pravian. Um, if you want to run a bunch of psychic Castellacs, then you need a Pravian, and one of these boys I'm sure could step in and fill the job. Personally, I'm a huge fan of the Thousand Suns characters, especially uh, Magistus. Magistus, there we go, Emon. 
Uh, he's just, he's so good. So there'll, there'll be limited space for subsequent HQs, and I don't think the Praetors from the box set are going to get a lot of use. Now, overall, the box set is very usable for Thousand Suns, and if the Spartan doesn't fit into your plans, you can always sell it off. So I'd pick one up. Let's now have a look at the 15th Legion's special rules and what that means for army building. Now, I've actually been describing their Legion special rules kind of as I go. They essentially revolve around the Myca minor arcana upgrades and giving a psychic discipline to any one of your independent characters. For, for a cost, of course. So, going into it, it's called Cult Arcana. Essentially, your infantry or cavalry units uh, for free can select one of the minor arcana options. Um, now, if they're independent characters for plus 15 points, they get to choose a psychic discipline. And that's, that's about it, right? Now, the depth comes from the minor arcana. We'll get into each of those in a minute. Uh, I'm going to structure the conversation that way because that seems a good way to do it. Now, the minor arcana upgrades are quite subtle in their nature and they do need a bit of work to get off. They also won't be particularly useful for all units. Right from the start, it's clear that Thousand Suns want to be focusing on infantry and cavalry. For that infantry, putting them in transports, not the worst idea in the world. But other vehicles and non-Osiren dreadnoughts need to be doing something pretty impressive to warrant inclusion and miss out on the free psychic shenanigans their foot slogging or bike riding counterparts can access. So let's chat about each of those minor arcana and which units benefit most. Starting up, Raptora. Now Raptora, essentially, if you move with a unit within 12 inches of an enemy unit, you get to get plus one uh, to your invulnerable save. Now, if you don't have an invulnerable save, that's six plus. If you have an invulnerable save of five plus already, that's going to four plus. Unfortunately, it can't make a four plus invul into a three plus. It maxes out at that four plus step. So Cataphracti, unfortunately, cannot benefit from this one. Bit of a shame but it is what it is. Now, I think this upgrade works best on your combat focus squads that you've tasked with taking out the specialist combat-centric enemy units, uh, so such as enemy Terminators, enemy Legion units with bulk power weapons, or enemy Dreadnoughts. This is also handy for charging into units packing ranged weapons that can get through your regular armor saves and are ready to just unleash them in a pesky Overwatch reaction. Tartarus Terminators are the obvious pick here as they benefit really nicely from going to a 4 plus invul save and you actually want them going up against those units that commonly have weapons that'll get through your regular armor saves, um, you know, giving them power fists, thunder hammers, whatever it is. So Tartarus Terminators are my pick for the, uh, for the Raptora here and I'd, I'd really want to include some of the Thousand Suns Army. Now looking at the next minor arcana, we've got the Pyre upgrade. So when a charge is declared for a unit that includes a Psyker with this power, you get Hammer of Wrath 2, special rule. Um, and, and it counts as flame attacks. Now, I don't know what that flame attack, that might be useful against, against other certain opponents. Um, I don't know if we've seen any yet where it has an impact, but I'm sure it will eventually. So Hammer of Wrath 2, really good, right? Now, this upgrade is best used on units that will be charging into combats, but they don't already have the Hammer of Wrath upgrade, which is quite a few of them. All units with jump packs, for instance, already have Hammer of Wrath 1, so you're missing out on kind of 50% of the bonus here. Yes, going up to Hammer of Wrath 2 is certainly better than nothing, um, but I really want to be putting this on units that don't have Hammer of Wrath at all. Now, a good example is that big Despoiler Squad, which I mentioned before, coming out of your Spartan or a, a separate Land Raider, or Cataphactor Terminators, Assaulting out a Deep Strike, are a great one to have the Pyre upgrade on as well. Keep waiting for that Rider War for that Deep Strike Chats. It's, it's coming. Now, next up, we have the Pavoni Minor Arcana Upgrade. Uh, it's plus three movement during the movement phase, uh, notably not affecting your charging distance, uh, so keep that in mind, but plus three movement is fantastic. This is great for any unit with line that needs to be moving around to capture objectives. It's great for units with short-ranged firepower that need to be able to move around, damage to do... Move around the table to make sure they're doing damage. It's great for any assault based unit that isn't deep striking or being transported into battle. And even if they are being transported into battle, that plus three movement still makes a difference on the turn you hop out. Um, tactical squads, tactical support squads, assault squads deployed on the table, terminators slogging up the battlefield, destroyers. It's a big list of units that are that will be taking this minor arcana. And I think it's going to be one of the more popular ones. It's one of the one of the least sexy ones, I guess, but I think it's gonna be a very solid one to take and you're gonna be wanting to use it in multiple turns 
noting that, of course, every turn that you do use it, you risk your heads exploding from perils of the warp. So that's something to consider as well. Now, next up, we get into kind of the shooty, the shooty powers, if you will. The first one is the Corvidae upgrade. Now, that essentially allows you to get a sneaky precision shot on that first wound. I'm not entirely positive on how this mechanic works. I assume it's allocating the wound after failed armor saves, maybe. And that if you wanted this to be put against a sergeant wearing artificer armor, your opponent would need to roll against their armor save at your discretion until they fail one? Or is it if they roll the first arm save and pass it, you don't get it anymore? So you really wanna be using it on weapons with decent AP? It's a bit confusing. Someone please correct me in the comments um, on how exactly this works in the simplest way they can because my mind's just gone all over the place with this one. Now, it's a bit tricky to use, but it certainly has the potential to be super useful depending on how that mechanic works if we, we work it out. Now, as the rule only works for the first wound, there are so many units against which this arcana just isn't that useful. I suppose the key is to have this on multiple units, allowing you to take out two wound characters, such as elite infantry sergeants or, or non-terminator consoles, apothecaries, within a single phase. That's a sweet spot. Taking out sergeants is, is kind of great, I guess, especially if you're, your opponent is also a Thousand Suns player, but I'd much rather be able to pick off apothecaries if I'm going to be, you know, doing psychic shenanigans to try and do something with precision shots. So I'd be taking this on heavy support squads where they can work in combination with each other as units with longer range weapons have that greater ability to work together and get range on the same enemy unit. Or, hear me out here, we just make sure we put the Corvide Minor Arcana upgrade on units that are going to be causing instant death. Here we go. So Laz Cannons are the obvious choice here and I wouldn't really bother with any other op options in this case if, if we're trying to do those two wounds with that instant death. The Les Cannons let us snipe out characters to our heart's content. Now, while using anti-armor weapons on infantry just to pull this off might not be worthwhile, I think a small five-man unit with sniper Les Cannons doesn't sound like the worst idea in the world. It sounds, it sounds pretty sweet. This also works really nicely on jet bikes or land speeder squadrons with multi-melters uh, for taking out characters when no vehicle presents themselves as targets. Instant death, it's gonna be, it's gonna be spicy. It also gives you a pretty good reason to put a plasma pistol on your sergeants within your tactical squads if you choose to take this power. Though be aware that if you lose your sergeant, you're losing your minor arcana upgrade. It's a risk versus reward, right? Uh, so putting a plasma pistol on a sergeant, just, uh, just another risk that you're taking. All right, now the final power I want to talk about uh, that, e that exists, or of course I have to talk about it, is the Athenaean. Um, mm, yep, that sounds about right. Uh, minor arcana power. So many strange words in this army. Now, this is my go-to for most shooting uni units, uh, especially those that have pinning weapons. As you're cause causing both pinning and leadership checks in the same shooting phase at the minus one leadership that this power puts onto the enemy unit that you're shooting at. So that's that's great. Now, the leadership check has to be as long as you kill 25% of the unit. The pinning has to be as long as you do a wound. But if you're ticking both those boxes, they're now making a pinning check and a leadership check at minus one to their leadership. I should say morale check in that first case, not leadership check. These words are important. So who do you want to give this to? Tactical support squads with rotor cannons are really great because they have pinning. Uh, recon squads with nemesis bolters. Not only are they one of the better units in the game, but now your opponent is taking minus one on their morale checks and their pinning checks. So good. Uh, heavy support squads with missile launchers firing frag rounds can start to do some wounds and some pinning. Um, all great choices. Essentially, I think this will be really popular and it synergizes really nicely with one of the rights of war. That spicy one I keep talking about. We're getting there. We're almost there. So, something to consider though. You really want to be taking bigger squads within a Thousand Suns army when you're taking those minor arcana upgrades as you're inevitably going to suffer multiple perils of the warp throughout your game. So, you need to have those bigger squads of infantry to soak up those wounds. Just something to think about when you're building your army and collecting your force. So, there was lots to talk about there. Complex rules, lots going on with the Thousand Suns. But with that covered, let's finally take a look at these Rites of War. The Thousand Suns have two very different looking Rites of War. They've got the Archaean, there we go, Archaean configuration and the Guard of the Crimson King. 
We'll kick off with the Guard of the Crimson King first, uh, as I've already alluded to it multiple times, and I think it's just so spicy. So the effects here are... The controlling player may designate up to six units from a detachment using this right of war that are made up entirely of models with the infantry unit type. These units gain the Deep Strike special rule. When these units are deployed as part of a Deep Strike assault, they gain the Fear 1 special rule for the duration of the turn in which they are deployed to the battlefield for the whole turn. So it's going to be having multiple impacts there. Now Sekhmet Cabals may be selected as troop choices for this detachment. When it comes to limitations, you must include either Magnus Red, Araman, or a Legion Praetor, uh, Legion Cataphracto Praetor, or Legion Tartarus Praetor. Upgraded to have the Psychic Discipline. Now, you're going to do that every single time. Almost, anyway. Unless I'm, I'm taking my Magister's aim on, but I'm not taking him in this list. Uh, the Rite of War also may not be used as an allied detachment. So, pretty much no downsides. And being able to Deep Strike 6 infantry units is just so powerful in this edition. Okay, it's, it's huge. Uh, the real power move here is selecting combat-focused units and having them charge into combat on the turn they deep strike in, which, of course, you can't do with drop-pod armies. Though there's certainly nothing wrong with bringing a few short-ranged but powerful shooting units. Uh, I probably want to bring tactical support squads with melted guns or either fire blasters to soften up targets or pop transports on the turn you arrive. But there's some other good options, and I'll, I'll get into them a little later. Later. <laughs> Causing fear and reducing the leadership of nearby enemy units works so nicely with the dip striking pinning mechanic, and it should be noted stacks with the Athenaean Minor Arcana that we talked about before. This is putting enemy units at minus two leadership for potential pinning from your Athenaean shooting squads, which will hopefully, noting, you know, of course, those squads that you're shooting at have to be within 12 of your deep striking units, which are causing the fear, uh, which will hopefully stop them from being able to react with an overwatch so your deep striking combat units can charge in. The synergy is really nice here, and it's a real hallmark for the Thousand Suns. We're coming back to that toolbox piece that I was talking about before. Uh, lastly, being able to take Sekhmet Cabala's troops, uh, that's the Thousand Sun Legion's Terminators, and they can take a core psychic discipline, which... And geez, there's some good psychic disciplines out there. So I really want to give these psychic terminators telepathy for even more pinning shenanigans. You're just at this point starting to really shut down significant parts of your enemy's army. If you haven't read up on the telepathy psychic power, please do so. It is obscene and it's just so good. Where reactions are such a huge part of this game, having a psychic power that can pin multiple units in a turn is outrageous. Now, this is a tactic that seems kind of rude, but it also really appeals to me. Uh, I'm not particularly a nice person, and this may be why. Uh, strongly recommend it. This, this thing is all about deep striking in, charging into combat, pinning your opponent's army. It's great. I love everything it's doing. So there's a lot of interesting army build options for this right of war. Uh, a bunch of stuff I've, I've already mentioned. So this right of war is so powerful and has a really unique feel to it. It creates multiple synergies to pin your own opponent in place, tear their army apart. I think a mix between combat units and short range firepower units is the sweet spot here. Um, trying to deep strike six combat units and get them all into assault in the one turn may be a bit tricky, especially depending on how your opponent uh, deploys to try and stop you doing that, I dare say. So I'd mix it up. I'd mix it up a bit. Uh, I'd also want some long-range units in this army with pinning weapons, so recons with Nemesis Bolters are the obvious choice. Now, for the combat units that are deep striking in, I'd be tempted to take at least one big but cheap unit of despoilers, just to get a whole bunch of bodies on the ground with a line subtype in your kind of enemy zone of control. Uh, next up, I'm always going to want to take at least one decent unit of Sekhmet Terminators, which, as I mentioned before, would want to take the Telepathy Psychic Discipline. We want two more combat units to really drive this theme home. So I think a unit of Thousand Suns, Kenatai, a Cult Cabal seem like a fun inclusion, if not particularly powerful, but let's let's get the flavor in there, right? So let's take one of those. And finally, a really big unit of Tartarus Terminators, or even better, actually, Indominus Terminators, which we saw in that Legacies document come out recently, for access um, cheaply cheap access to, to power fists and chain fists to deal with enemy dreadnoughts, but that can still benefit from that Raptora minor arcana. That leaves two spots open for of our of our six infantry that we're deep striking in. So tactical support squads that I mentioned with with either melter guns or the either fire blasters do great work here. 
Uh, breaches could also be fun, especially if there's more objectives on your opponent's side of the table that need to be secured by a hardy unit that can still put down some close range firepower. Essentially pick what you like. Uh, a Mortalis Destroyer squad is also a great choice and can be kitted out to perform some niche roles that your other squads maybe can't quite pull off. Another good idea is veteran squads with their two wounds. Um, kit them out with a bunch of special shooting weapons and they're, they're pretty tasty as well. Now to lead your deep striking contingent, Magnus is the obvious choice here and the one I'd, I'd be looking at first as he comes organically with deep strike. So won't take up one of your six slots. But if you don't have the points, or you're playing a smaller game, Aramon is the next best thing, and will end up costing you kind of about the same points as a Praetor with the Psychic Discipline upgrade anyway. To support your Deep Strike and Contingent, I really like a couple of Legion Reconnaissance squads to hold home objectives. They have line, they're amazing. Uh, they're really hard to reach with their Shroud Bombs, and they contribute to your pinning shenanigans with Nemesis Bolter Rifles. You could also double down on the deep striking theme with some assault squads, but having some decent boots on the ground prior to your reserves turning up is super important uh, so to make sure you're not getting tabled. So I think the reconnaissance squads are the better way to go here. So that is the uh, Guard of the Crimson King Right of Wall. Now, if you'd rather rampage across the table with a horde of psychic robots, then you're going to want to check out the Archaean Configuration. The idea here is that this detachment uh, can select Castellax Archaea Automata, Automata units as non-compulsory troop choices. Uh, any model with it detached from this detachment using this right of war that is within 12 of your Castellax uh, and suffers the peril of the warp may choose to allocate all the wounds inflicted by that perils of the warp to the Castellax. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Now, uh, lastly, a Castellax Archaea K model in a detachment using this right of war is considered to have the line subtype. Very good. Uh, as long as that model is within six inches of a friendly model with both the Legiones Astartes special rule and the Psyker subtype. Cool, cool. Limitations here. Any Castellax AK Automata, Automata units selected as trip choices must include more than one model, which look, they're expensive, but sure. A detachment using this right of war must include at least one Legion Tech Marine Covenant. Okay. And a detachment using this right of war must include at least one model from the, uh, sorry, with the Legionos Consularis Special Rule that has selected the Legion Pravian upgrade. So lots of requirements there. Now, what are the pros? You have a bunch of Castellax <laughs> as troops. Great. Frees up your lease slots uh, and gives you a bunch of killy robots in your troop slots. But honestly, I don't think these Castellax RK are fantastic. They're going to really struggle against enemy Dreadnoughts and even Terminators in close combat. Uh, with that weapon skill of three, it, oh, they're just, they're, they're hidden a bit, they're a bit limp, a bit limp in close combat. And honestly, their firepower isn't that great either because it's only got a f AP of four and it's only rending on six plus. These guys don't overly inspire me. I think it's a lot of points for something that feels like it's going to fall a little flat. Uh, now, on, on the upside, though, on the upside, the miniatures look fantastic. So, so that's that's something. Uh, this is pros and cons, by the way. I'm going, I'm going back and forth in here. So um, the ability to suffer the perils of warp um, on these guys instead of your multitude of psychers is kind of a two-edged sword, as your Castellacs are often going to be more expensive than the unit suffering the perils of the warp. We're talking about 140 points a model right? They're not, they're not cheap and they've only got four wounds. But I'd definitely be using this ability if something like a, my, my Osiris and Dreadnought, for instance, was going to explode itself with, with power of the warp. So gaining line, gaining line is handy back into pros. So giving this unit line is great, though you've got to have someone within six inches with the psychic power. So it's got to be an infantry unit, perhaps, or a, or a cavalry unit with their sergeant still alive, I might add. But using these as objective holders, oh, I'm not sure I want to do that either. They only have a, a three plus save, so they don't have great staying power. And I certainly want to, wouldn't want to keep them on my backfield holding objectives. I, I want them up in the opponent's face. So I'm not that excited about them getting line. And some missions, it'll be better than others, I suppose. Uh, but you do need a unit to babysit them as well. Uh, they're an expensive unit to have another unit to babysit them, knowing that that unit could have line anyway. So it's a bit, it's a bit eh. I'm seeing a lot of meh coming through. Uh, the extra tax of having to take a Tech Marine Covenant and a Pravian Console just starts to add up to this right of war, not giving me an overly warm and fuzzy feeling. But, you know, saying that, it's a lot of fun, and I think it's going to look really cool, because as I said, these models are just beautiful. So let's take a look at how we build out 
this army. Now, your warp-powered Castlags uh, have a few natural enemies out there. Predominantly, anything armed with missile launchers, which can often be taken on mass, and the ubiquitous Dreadnought. So we want to deal with these. So we want to build the army around dealing with these issues that our Castlags are going to have. Firstly, dealing with the missile launchers. Most commonly found in bulk within heavy support squads. Well, all those pinning shenanigans that I talked about before are a really good starting point for dealing with infantry units that will otherwise be bunkered down in the backfield of our opponent's deployment zone. If you're going to include a few units of recon marines or scouts to take care of these with Nemesis bolters, it might also be worth looking at Magistus Amon, who has Master of the Legion, which is handy, and I personally think he's just the absolute bee's knees. He is such a cool character. Read up on him. He's amazing. Um, I'd want to give him a beefed up Seeker Squad to infiltrate with and, and keep our Reconnaissance and scout squads, scout squads back in our deployment zone, pinning enemy units with their 72-inch Nemesis Bolters. So that's dealing with Missile Launcher Squads. Just pin them. Pin them right down um, with our Athenaean Minor Arcana, giving them minus one leadership. Now, when it comes to dealing with Dreadnoughts, there's nothing better than another Dreadnought. The Brutal 3 on their Grevas Power Fist makes all the difference here, and you can happily trade your Dreadnoughts with your opponent, while your Castlacks are freed up to prey on weaker enemy infantry. This almost kind of becomes a, a weirdly psychically fueled mix between Fury of the Ancients and, a, and an Iron Brethren list, but with a whole bunch more flavor. Uh, and I think it's kind of definitely better than an Iron Brethren list, because you get psychic shenanigans in there, and it, it just it kind of looks cool. Now, other things I want to include in this list, um, for the mandatory Tech Marine and Pravian characters that we have to take, I'm going to give that Tech Marine a Cognus Signum and, and probably chuck him in one of my Reconnaissance squads and leave him to it. That boosts your ballistic skill by one for those that aren't aware, which is, which is kind of nice. Now, the Pravian, whose special rules are almost useless, uh, I should note, with, uh, with the Castlax, aka having the rules they do, uh, but I'd chuck it in a unit with one of the Castlax. Maybe give it a power fist to help out our robots in case they do find themselves in combat with something a little tougher than them. Once you've taken a couple of decent units of Castlax, noting they can be taken in units of up to five, and some other troops to fill out your mandatory slot slots and open up some more line options, you're kind of starting to hit your points limits. So we're we're at the kind of end of this army build. But if you do have any points left, some units of Tartarus Terminators to support our Castlax and keep up with them certainly wouldn't go astray. Or maybe some, some long-range firepower from Whirlwinds or Rapier Batteries, which I tried for the first time last week, and they're fantastic. Uh, just to soften up those nasty targets before we charge in and contribute to that pinning we mentioned earlier. So that is the 2000 Suns right of war. We've got the Guard of the Crimson King, which is so powerful, maybe one of the more powerful in the game, and the Archaean configuration, which I think falls a little limp. But it comes down to your personal preference and what you like to run. Now, I've discussed the Thousand Suns characters as we've gone through this, so I'm not going to go into any further depth, and we're also pushing it for time. Uh, needless to say, all three are very solid choices, and I think they'll find their way into most armies. Saying that, the Thousand Suns Warlord traits are also really nice, so some people might be tempted to take a regular old Praetor just to try them out, noting that your Praetor can get that Psychic Discipline for only 15 points, which is, which is super spicy, really nice there. All in all, the Thousand Suns have so much potential and a really interesting army to build with a ton of decision points and interesting choices. That will bring us to the end of our Legion build chats for Thousand Suns. The Death Guard, indomitable, resilient, traitorous pawns to the Chaos Gods of Plague and Filth, and also, apparently, pretty quick moving around the table. The Death Guard have taken a really interesting direction in this edition, being able to move and still keep putting down punishing amounts of firepower. These guys have real potential, both in damage output and mission win conditions. Let's have a look. First up, the box set. The Death Guard can make excellent use of the Age of Darkness box set. The mainstay of most 14th Legion armies is going to be tactical squads and heavy sports squads, chiefly because of their Legion special rules, but also due to their rights of war. This means that the 40 Mark VI lads you're getting in this kit will 100% be put to good use, and you wouldn't be out of line if you were looking to pick up some more. Death Guard are predominantly an army that revolves around table control and big juicy tactical squads, who can move and still unleash their Fury of the Legion, and they're central to this tactic. The 10 Cataphracti Terminators fit just fine in a Death Guard list. Uh, one of the Death Guard's rights of war actually stops all units from running, which means that one of the cataphracti's biggest weaknesses, 
suddenly isn't so concerning. My only concern around the Cataphracti is that Death Guard already have two Legion specific Terminator units that you'll probably want to include in your army for flavor if nothing else. But until you pick those up, these guys will do make good stand-ins and do plenty of work in a Death Guard army. They can also be useful for conversions, depending on what other kits or bits you can get your hands on. Whether you're transporting your Cataphracti around, uh, a big unit of Death Shroud, or any other multitude of threats, a Spartan is a welcome addition to any Death Guard army. And the Spartan often struggles in other lists. You both want to be moving it forward as fast as possible to deliver its payload, but you also don't want to be compromising its impressive firepower. Not an issue with the Death Guard, you can move its full 12 inches forward and unleash all of its weapons at full ballistic scale. In fact, the Death Guard probably do Spartans and other, other assault transports better than, than any other Legion. Dreadnoughts work as well in Death Guard armies as they do anywhere else, which is to say you're almost always going to take at least one. Uh, I actually really like the Death Guard's advanced reaction for Contempted Dreadnoughts. While you may not be able to take advantage of the morale shenanigans, getting a 4 plus damage mitigation and a free 7 inch move is going to feel obnoxiously good on a close combat focused Dread. Uh, maybe better on a Leviathan, but certainly nothing to, uh, nothing to shirk at for a, for a Contemptor. Lastly, the Praetors work nicely for Death Guard, uh, aesthetically and for the myriad of HQ options you might want to use them as. Big, chunky boys that suit a Legion known for its chunk. So overall, the box set is a great start for a Death Guard player. Now let's have a look at the 14th Special Rules. So I've already touched on it a bit, but essentially Death Guard, who aren't cavalry or artillery, can do the following. They can ignore modifiers or restrictions on moving during the movement phase as long as they don't run or move in some alternative way, such as using a jump pack or getting out of a transport. Uh, so essentially, difficult terrain doesn't slow them down, and they can still move while they're pinned. Ah, and Death Guard vehicles still move when crew stunned. Now, as long as they don't run, uh, they can also be counted as stationary when making shooting attacks. This is epic. Infantry can shoot heavy weapons after moving. Vehicles can shoot all of their weapons at full ballistic skill after moving at cruising speed, uh, or even flat out if it's a fast vehicle. All this combines to make Death Guard super maneuverable on the table, as they're not sacrificing damage output for movement. In objective-based games, this will be super impactful. All army building, uh, for army building, it means you can go all in on certain units with other legions might not look at. Heavy support squads are the obvious choice. Uh, a unit with 10 LAS cannons is my answer to pretty much anything in Heresy 2nd Edition. And being able to move and still shoot at full ballistic skill with that unit is just so nice. Tactical squads and their ability to Fury of the Legion after moving makes them a very powerful uh, unit in Death Guard armies. And Breacher squads with a bunch of Graviton guns for dealing with Dreadnoughts can do really good work here. They're not worried about the, the heavy type that that weapon has anymore. Reconnaissance squads can move and still fire their nemesis bolters. There's just so many opportunities to take advantage of this rule. It also makes assault-based armies better, as even if your units gets pinned, they're skill still going to, to get their regular movement, even if they can't run. So they're still going to be moving towards the enemy, which is what you need to do to win games. So big despoiler squads, assault squads, who can at least get their 7 inches of movement in a turn that they're pinned, and footslogging terminators all benefit from this. Pinning can be absolutely crippling to assault armies, and there's so much of it in this edition. Being able to ignore the movement denial is awesome. As I said before, Spartans and, and other assault transports with a large number of weapons on them are better in Death Guard than anywhere else. Similarly, any vehicles with multiple powerful weapons, and I'm looking at you Kratos, has far greater maneuverability in the Death Guard, and just a better of options on which units it can get to and shoot at. This Legion Special Rule is one of the best in the game and has a significant impact on how it opens up army building for the Death Guard. Now that we're hyped on what the Death Guard can do and what units are outperforming their non-Death Guard compatriots, let's check out their Rites of War. Both De Death Guard Rites of War have serious spice, so let's start with the Reaping. So the effects of the Reaping, Legion Vet Squads may be taken as troop choices, Legion Heavy Support Squads can be taken as non-compulsory troops choices. Any model chosen as part of a detachment using this Rite of War can take Rad Grenades. Uh, that is, if it's a, a character and, and, and a Death Guard. So all your sergeants can take 
Rad grenades. Now, rad grenades, for those that aren't aware, uh, I'm pretty sure this is correct. In combat, uh, your opponent is at minus one toughness. Now, the limitations. Uh, models taken as part of this detachment may not make run moves or make any reaction that allows them to make a move, with the exception of the remorseless advanced reaction. That is the death guard advanced reaction. So you're not going uh, forward or backwards off movement, which is, look, it is impactful uh, and it does hurt a little, but it is what it is. Uh, no unit in detachment using this right of war may be assigned to a deep strike assault, subterranean assault, or flanking assault. Um, you're going to be on the board or coming on normally from reserves. You have got to love that army-wide access to rag grenades. Uh, I'm super about that. So how do we build out this right of war? Well, it's not rocket science. You're going heavy on infantry and heavy on shooting. You want at least one squad of vets, they're, they're troops, so why wouldn't you, uh, who I think make great delivery mechanisms for bulk power weapons with their weapon skill of five and do even better in combat with rag grenades. Maybe include a couple of grav guns to slow down your opponent and just make a general nuisance of yourself. You want some heavy sports squads? Uh, my preference, as I mentioned already, is always las cannons, but they are expensive. They're not that much more expensive, but they are. So there's certainly something to be said for a squad with auto cannons or missile launchers. Uh, to fill out the troops, big, beefy tactical squads or breacher squads does what the Death Guard wants to be doing and gives you those line units that you need in some missions. Because uh, this right of war does not unlock, unlock line uh, for any of those extra troops. Recon squads with Nemesis Bolters are also a great choice, uh, really in any army, let's be honest. And if you do go down that auto cannon option for one of your heavy support squads, always consider a Siege Breaker console as a second HQ choice, uh, which we actually see in the uh, in the next Rite of War. Uh, now arm all of these squads with Toxin Bombs and Rad Grenades just because you can, uh, and don't forget those Augury Scanners either to really punish any army that thinks they're going to deep strike on you. From there, it's really up to you. Uh, I'd avoid big units of foot-slogging assault troops as they can't run. Uh, Cataphract Terminators, therefore, are a probably better choice. Death Shroud Terminators in a Land Raider to get up the table is really nice. Grave Wardens, who are happy to walk and keep the firepower raining down upon their foes. Uh, these guys act as really good counter-assault units when your opponent comes to dig your heavy sports squads out of cover that you're hiding in. A couple of Dreadnoughts sure wouldn't go astray in this list. Uh, I'd arm them with something nasty for range shooting as you're not going to be running them. Leviathans, great option here. They're heavy, so they can't run anyway. Uh, and you're not worried about their lower movement as your opponent's probably going to have to come to you. Now, if you do end up going Dreadnought heavy, a couple of Tech Marines supporting your heavy support squads by improving their ballistic skills, I think with Cognos Signums, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and healing your Dreadnoughts up as well is kind of a, a cool little strat there. Lastly, for extra HQ choices, uh, Kalos Typhon to unlock the right of war uh, is a great pick, uh, and the army build really encourages it. He'd be my go-to over a regular Praetor here, and he's not that much more expensive at only 200 points. A Master of Signals is also a top choice to provide a multitude of benefits to one of your heavy sports squads. Night fighting is just, it's so great to pick up. That's what I really love him for, amongst all the other things. But also, because you're not going to be deep striking, you're more than happy to have him hand out his blanket 50% chance to disorder any cheeky deep strike assaults that your opponent might be trying to pull on you. Now, if you're more into destroying the natural environment of a world and turning it into a radioactive swamp, the creeping death is where you want to be looking. So, its effects. Um, let's see, all models in detachment automatically pass any dangerous terrain tests they called upon to take. All models in the deployment zone of this detachment gain Shrouded 6+. Plus. Very nice. Um, and the entire deployment zone of your detachment counts as difficult terrain and dangerous terrain. All zones of area terrain on the battlefield, uh, including you know, jungles, woods, ruins, craters, are counted as dangerous terrain for everybody. And in a detachment using this right of war, Grave Warden Terminator squads can be taken as non-compulsory troops. Some really interesting stuff there. Now, limitations, uh, you can only be a trader while you're doing this, and apparently loyalist death guard, they're more about planting trees. Uh, and the army using this right of war must include a legion centurion, catafacti centurion, or tatar centurion with the siege breaker legion console upgrade, which I mentioned before, you're not sad about it. You almost always want to take that guy when you're taking heavy sports squads with auto cannons, which the death guard really want to do. So there's a few ways you can go with this one, uh, but I'd be keen to take advantage of the dangerous terrain in our deployment zone and added area terrain throughout the battlefield. 
So to do this, I think a defensive army with plenty of long range shooting may be the best way to go. But you can also equally go for units that benefit the most from never having to worry about dangerous terrain when moving. So let's look at both builds. First up, that defensive army. Now there's a bit of crossover here with the units that we took for the reaping. Heavy sports squads, tacticals, recon squads, and really anything else uh, that can put out some serious damage at long range. I'm a huge fan of rapier batteries with laser destroyers, uh, so we'd definitely be including those in this list. Uh, this right of war, if you're going down the defensive route, is also my go-to for a vehicle heavy list. Land Raiders, Sakarans, Predators, Whirlwind, Scorpius, they're kind of my top picks for vehicles. All great choices, and they gain a lot from both the enemy being slowed down as they try to cross the board, as well as from a 6 plus shroud for all units in your deployment zone. Just make sure you're taking those blades on those vehicles, because uh, while they ignore the modif movement modifiers from difficult terrain, I believe you still have to take a mobilization tests whenever you move a vehicle. Now, alternatively, you can go for an army that really benefits from ignoring dangerous terrain. Uh, units such as jet bikes, land speeders, assault squads, characters with jump packs, you can just go absolutely all in. Now, are your cavalry better than the white scars? Yes, yes they are, kind of, enough that it makes mocking them appropriate. Uh, this, is, this is more of a fun build than anything, as I'm pretty dubious on the survivability of jet bikes, but geez, it would look so cool uh, and be a really fun alternate way to play Death Guard. You can conduct a deep strike assault with this right of war too, uh, so those assault marines can all be deep striking into combat while not having to worry about scattering into area terrain. Now to suit theme, whichever way you go, I'm going to include some Grave Wardens. I don't love the unit, uh, but I make a point of including Legion unique units in my armies, because otherwise, what's the point? This right of war requires a Siege Breaker console, which is hardly a tax at all, we've already discussed taking this guy for the reaping. You're chucking this guy in with a heavy sports squad, all armed with auto cannons for extra vehicle destroying goodness at a budget price. He gives them Sunder, which is those re-rolls uh, to penetrate, uh, or to, you know, whatever you want to call that. Uh, or at least, you know, you can keep him close by while running in with a counter assault unit. He doesn't actually have to be in the squad. It's a squad within six inches, which is really nice. In this Legion in particular, uh, that's easy to do as your heavy sports squads can keep pace without diminishing firepower. So you can have a Terminator squad with your your Siege Breaker in it, marching up the battlefield, and your Heavy Sport Squad just slightly behind it, to the left or right, and still getting that sun to benefit and moving and shooting. Great synergy here. Uh, you're also definitely taking a unit of Rapiers with Foxfex canisters alongside your Laser Destroyers. Uh, when the narrative and the army options match so perfectly, who are you to say no? And that's the two Death Guard Rites of War. Both are very viable. We've got the Reaping and the Creeping Death. They provide some interesting game mechanics and army build options, and are flexible enough to allow some really balanced gameplay. We've briefly discussed Callus Typhon, who fits neatly into either Rite of War, or really any army build without any significant impact or requirements. Um, go easy mode, put him in a unit of Grade Wardens, and you can't go wrong. Um, Mortarion is an absolute whirlwind. Um, this is, you know, the Death Guard's only other character, essentially. Their Primarch. Uh, send him towards a bunch of elite infantry, and he'll do what he needs to. Preferably, put them in a unit of Death Shroud Terminators. Once again, the narrative, why wouldn't you? Uh, their chosen warrior special rule means your opponent won't be able to waste Mortarion's attacks with pesky challenges. The Death Shroud also won't slow them down as they're in Tartarus armor, so they can run, um, which means you, you probably wouldn't want to be taking them in a Reaping Army. Now, hot tip, always take a Legion Standard when you've got the option. So if you're going to run Death Shroud, chuck a Legion Standard in there. The benefits are just wild. The last thing I want to talk about here is some unique war gear that's available to Death Shroud. Toxin Bombs are absolutely amazing. Uh, for, you do have to be traitor, mind you, but for only 10 points, when an enemy unit declares a charge against you, they have to roll a d6 for each model in the unit that declared that charge, and for each roll of a 1, a model in the unit that declared the charge, chosen by the controlling player, suffers a wound. Uh, no armor save, cover save, or damage mitigation rolls may be made against this wound, but they can still have invulnerable saves. So essentially dangerous terrain uh, for every single model in an enemy unit when it's charging in. That is fantastic. And for 10 points, I'd be taking that so often, especially because Death Guard are looking at more of a mid-range shooting army. It's just, it's so appropriate and so much fun. So I put them on all of your, uh, all your characters in your shooting units and it just makes charging you 
just so unpleasant because they're not only suffering from Overwatch, they're now getting these Toxin Bombs as well. Uh, when looking at Warlord traits, I'd actually be looking at, usually you look at getting that extra reaction in the shooting phase, I'd maybe be looking at getting it in the Assault phase, just so you can make charging your army so horrible. Um, look, there's Power Scythes, these are fine. AP3, rating 6+, plus, eh. You take them for flavor and for the wonderful aesthetics, because what doesn't look cooler than a post-human with a giant scythe? Uh, and lastly, Alchem weapons, are they're a bit of fun, uh, and all those extra wounds will inevitably do work. You could do much worse than chuck a tactical support squad or, or heavy support squad with their respective Alchem flamers into a list. The Ultramarines. Honorable, resourceful, strategically brilliant, and busy establishing their treasonous Imperium Secundus while the galaxy burns. The 13th are a really interesting legion to build. Their rules attempt to represent their tactical flexibility, and in doing so, create a lot of decision points for an Ultramarine player, both before and during a battle. They have the potential to be one of the most powerful legions of the game, depending on how one views the legacies of the Age of Darkness. I don't usually get into the Legacies units in these build videos, but the Ultramarine Legacy units are so good that it doesn't seem reasonable to leave them out of the analysis. So let's get into it. First up, the Age of Darkness box set. The Ultramarines are arguably one of the best legions to build when making use of the Age of Darkness box set. An effective 13th Legion force is formed around numerous units that support each other, working in pairs at the micro level and utilizing a flexible playstyle approach that can take full advantage of their Legion special rule. This means tactical squads, it means assault squads, it means support squads, recon squads, and veteran squads. It means that you'll have plenty of reasons to need 40 plus Mark VI Marines. The 10 Cataphracti Terminators don't gain much from the Ultramarine Legion's special rule or their advanced reaction, but as a close combat rock to hold your line or bog down an opponent's Death Star, these guys will definitely find a place. Alternatively, strap missile launchers onto their backs and suddenly you have 10 of arguably the most powerful shooting unit in the game, the Fulmentaris Terminators from the Legacy's PDF. Now, there's plenty of third-party online stores or 3D printing options for those missile launchers, and with no official models for the film on Terrace, this is your best bet. One of the Ultramarine's unique elite units, the Invictaris Suzerain, are just insanely good, but they're also slow. A Spartan Landrunner gets them where they want to be with unmatched survivability. Expensive, but oh so powerful. You're always going to want a unit of Invictaris in an Ultramarine's army, so a Spartan will not be an uncommon sight in the forces of the 13th. Dreadnoughts are great. Ultramarines are into them, like everyone else. Uh, the Ballistic Skill of 5 means they make the perfect unit to shoot first and give the plus 1 to shoot to a unit nearby through the Legion's special rule. Uh, perhaps march them up the battlefield next to your Spartan and, and get them to work together to shoot at the same targets. Lastly, the Praetors from the box set. The Praetors fit nicely in an Ultramarine's army. Uh, I'd be very keen to convert one to be holding a Legion standard and representing our boy Remus Ventanus. Uh, Ventanus? Ventanus? The saviour of Kalf. Uh, Remus gets work done in combat, but most importantly, he lets every single, that is every single one, every Ultramarine unit in your army automatically pass leadership tests and morale checks as long as they have a model within three inches of an objective with his resolute planning warlord trait. That is the kind of warlord trait that wins games. It is absolutely outrageous. Remus is fantastic. Uh, so that is that. The box set is a great purchase for Ultramarine player. Uh, let's move on now and have a look at the impact of the 13th special rules. I've already mentioned it a few times, but for completeness sake, let's read through it. So it is called The Strength of Wisdom. It reads, when rolling to hit for a model with this special roll as part of a shooting attack, add plus one to the result of the roll if the enemy unit targeted by the attack has already been the target of another friendly unit composed entirely of models with this special roll in the same shooting phase, and if the attacking model is within six inches of a model from that friendly unit. This does not affect attacks, maybe the blast or barrage special rule. So just to simplify that down, what you want to do is have two units uh, or more, and you want to have one of your ultramarine units shoot at an enemy unit, and then another ultramarine unit nearby within six inches shoot at the same unit to get plus one to their 
shooting attack, that is to hit. Uh, so really good rule, plus one to hit is absolutely fantastic. Uh, so what does this mean for army building? Well, you're obviously going to want to be favoring shooting, or at least making sure your army has a decent amount of it to take advantage of this excellent rule. It also means that to make sure this rule is getting off, it's worth considering putting what we'll call spotter units into your army. Uh, these are units that are either cheap points wise, so you don't mind missing out on the legion rule benefit to activate it for those squads around them, or they already have ballistic skill five. So get no bonus from the plus one to shoot. Anyway, night fighting notwithstanding, of course. So rhino transports for tactical squads and, and tactical support squads seem like a really good choice. Rapier batteries for heavy support squads are, are really nice to sit in that backfield. Uh, dreadnoughts marching up the board alongside land raiders. And land speeders for big units of bikes or squadrons of vehicles. Just an extra, you know, one or two scattered around your army to shoot at the enemy. And the key is to kit these spotter units out with weapons that complement uh, the target choices of the unit they're spotting for. And to make sure that you deploy them in a way that they can work. Together. Now, your opponent, of course, can try and take out these spotter units, but if, for instance, they're shooting a squad of 10 LAS cannons or, or 10 missile launchers at that one little land speeder that you've got flitting about, giving out a plus one to hit, you're already winning, right? You're, uh, you're t making your opponent play your game and waste resources on units that in the end aren't that important. Now, I already mentioned night fighting, but it's worth noting that due to this Legion special rule, Ultramarines will, for the most part, and within 24 inches of their opponent, be able to ignore the negative modifiers of night fighting to their shooting while their opponent cannot. It's just about making the call whether your reduced offensive output is worth it to increase your survivability. It'll come down to deployment, your opponent's army, your own squad builds, and the mission. If you've got Remus on the board, uh, with his handing out of pseudo-fearless to any of your units near an objective, then taking advantage of the leadership modifiers from night fighting also becomes a no-brainer. Uh, same, same, uh, one of the commands out of their right of war, and we'll get to that soon, also adds to their leadership. So you can really start playing the leadership game through night fighting, as well as the shooting part of it. Now, I've said it before and I'll say it again, there's a lot of decision points for an Ultramarines player, and I think this Legion really rewards smart play. Uh, it is a shame, however, that the Ultramarines' unique units get almost no benefit from this special rule, with the aforementioned uh, Fulmentaris Terminators already having Ballistic Skill 5, and the remainder of the Legion's unique units being close combat focused. Ultramarines, all about balance, apparently, who would have thought? So, that's the Legion special rule, now that we understand what the Ultramarines are trying to do, let's check out their right of war. Just one, that's right, uh, they do not get two or more like most other Legions, they get one, it is called the Logos Lectora. Now, it is a right of war that is both excellent and potentially punishing if you're not playing a smart game. So let's read through it very quickly, uh, and I'll skim over some bits here. Now, at the be beginning of each turn in which the controlling player, blah, 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 you select one of the commands. Now, you can't select these commands twice in a row in, in subsequent turns, but you can choose not to. It is a may. Uh, the effects of this command are applied to all models in the army that have the ultramarine special rule and are an infantry unit type. Um, they last until the start of the controlling player's next turn as the active player. So what are the commands? Uh, the commands are full march, hold fast, retribution strike, and regroup. Now full march essentially lets you add plus two to your movement skill, movement <laughs> movement skill, I don't even know what that is, to your movement value, there we go, but you then have to reduce your ballistic skill and weapon skill characteristic by minus one. Now, this is for all infantry across your army, okay? So, you're moving really fast. This is probably, I think, the least useful command unless you're going all out on close combat, um, but we'll, we'll continue on. Hold fast. Now, all models with infantry uh, must increase their leadership by one and also re-roll all failed to hit rolls during a shooting attack. Amazing, so good, uh, but may not move or run in the movement phase, which is of course extremely punishing uh, and will impact your army if you're not careful. 
Then we've got Retribution Strike. Uh, all models with the inventory increase their weapon skill by plus one and gain an additional bonus of plus one to any charge rolls they make. Really great. Weapon skill is extremely important in this edition. Uh, but you do have to reduce your ballistic skill uh, by minus one. Lastly is regroup. All models that are infantry may reroll failed leadership tests made to regroup while falling back in any failed reserve rolls. Okay. So those are really good, uh, but can also be really punishing if you make uh, if you make some mistakes during your battle. Now the limitations here, essentially you uh, take an additional compulsory HQ and it has to be either a Master of Signals or a Legion Damocles Command Rhino. And then detachments using this right of war must take an additional compulsory troop choice. And lastly, you cannot deploy using the infiltrate special rule or enter play via any of the, the odd things like deep strikes, subterranean or flanking assault. So drop pods are no good. Now, there is a lot going on there and there's a bunch of ways you can go with this one. Uh, the key is to build an army with a plan on how you're going to employ each of the Logos Lectora commands, which turns you're going to pop them off, in which order, and the impact this will have on your units. It's quite complex. Uh, there will certainly need to be flexibility in your plan to adapt to your opponent, but going on with a system and an understanding of the impacts, your unit selection, is vital with the Ultramarines and this Rite of War. Now, I believe you can effectively build this Rite of War to be either balanced, shooting focused, or you can go all out on a close combat approach. The commands benefits whichever way you choose to go. The rules only impact infantry, uh, both from a benefit and a limitation perspective, so keep that in mind when we're building as well. Now, the balanced approach is the most complex and provides more decision points before and during your game, so that's what I'm going to discuss today. It's also more interesting to play in, and I feel closer to the tactical flexibility of the Ultramarines lore. The Logos Lectora commands revolve around either movement, shooting, or charging. So it becomes a game of maximizing their effectiveness at the appropriate times while reducing their negative impacts. Unfortunately, there's no deep striking or outflanking, which is a real shame, because that would overcome the crippling impact of the whole fast command. Uh, so how do we build this balance approach? Now, the key is to build an army that can outshoot your opponent at long range, uh, not hard with a large portion of your army hitting on two pluses and re-rolling to hit uh, with the hold fast special rule. You then back this up with a solid counter attack element to engage once the enemy closes in, including infantry and transports, which are free to move on the turns. You've activated your hold fast command mixed with non-infantry that are not impacted by the Logos Lectora commands at all. For your shooting element, Fulmentaris Terminators were made for this right of war, uh, as they don't need line of sight to their target if they don't move. It's just, they're so obnoxious. Uh, other infantry with long range heavy weapons fit in nicely. Heavy sports squads with las cannons or heavy bolters. Recon or scout squads with nemesis bolters. I'd throw in a few tanks. Uh, they can still move and lay down some decent firepower if you find their, their enemies trying to hide from you. As the infantry gets to reroll hits during your holdfast commands, it's probably worth using them to target units first and then provide the Ultramarines plus one to hit to nearby non-infantry units, such as Predators and Sakarans. Landspeeder Javelins kitted out in an anti-tank roll, a nice hit too. And then finally, you're going to need some tactical squads, uh, as is most armies. So a couple of them maybe to hold backline objectives and meet the troop tax and generally do tactical squad things. Uh, I'd put them in rhinos so they can move on to objectives in the early turns if they need to. The The beauty of this uh, this right of war is while your infantry can't move, if they're in a transport, they can because the tank is moving and the tank is an infantry. So you can, you can get around it and be a bit sneaky. Now for your close combat element, you're going to need to put your infantry in land raiders if you want to get them up the board in those early turns. Uh, one unit of Invictara Suzerain is almost mandatory they're just so good one unit is enough though uh self-restraint is important when playing the 13th legion uh, i would put this unit in the spartan uh, that you no doubt have lying around and you you can't go wrong big units of terminators also do work and really enjoy the extra weapon skill and charge distance they get from the retribution strike command just puts them up above where they are where they usually perform whereas the suzerain they, they don't care as much uh, regular old land raiders will do the job here. You don't have the points for more than one Spartan. So regular land raiders for this big unit of Terminator will do the job just fine. Uh, don't forget, you can put some pretty decent combi weapons on your Terminators too, in case they need to switch to a shooting roll. 
Uh, with your combi weapons, if you put the Volkite option on there, or one of the Volkite options, I think there's two, uh, you can shoot with that every single turn because it's just a minor combi option and you can shoot with your bolters in the same turn as well. Uh, so while they're not doing any kind of powerful shooting, the amount of shots they're putting out can be pretty crippling uh, and pretty significant. So definitely something to consider. Alternatively, uh, a cheaper option and one that helps to fill out the three mandatory troop slots you've got in this right of war, as well as providing more line units, is to pack your land raiders with the spoiler squads. Now, they're not as survivable or flexible as Terminators, so maybe a mix of the two units is the way to go. Add support your close combat infantry with Dreadnoughts, who don't need to worry about Logos like Tora commands, and can pass on the Ultramarine shooting bonus to the land raiders as they advance together. You've got a mandatory Master of Signals that is hanging out in the backfield, providing some shooting bonuses to one of your heavy support squads. Not that you really need it with all the bonuses you're already getting. Uh, does help with night fighting though. Never forget the Master of Signals gives night fighting to the unit they're attached to. Now you then just need to unlock the uh, right of war with your last HQ choice or one of your other HQ choices. I think Remus, Remus Ventanus, who I've already gushed about, is my go-to for achieving this. He's just so good, does so much for your army, and gets your right of war going with the Master of the Legion special rule. Now, the complexity of this right of war is probably higher than any other legions and quite restrictive for army building, so if you're a new player, it might be worth trying out something a little simpler first. Pride of the Legion is a good backup for the Ultramarines, who have a lot of competition in their elite slot, and now you're also taking Flamentaris Terminators as troops, which is just disgusting. Please do not take more than one unit. One is enough. Uh, do, not be, do not be that person in your gaming group. Now, there's not much else to discuss for the Ultramarines. Uh, that is how I would build out that right of war, that flexible approach. You can, of course, go all in on shooting. You can go all in on combat. Uh, the combat in particular is pretty juicy. Maybe a bunch of assault squads. You can't deep strike them, no, but you've got plus two to movement uh, in those early turns. And when you're ready to charge in, you pop off for that plus one charge distance. Not that you probably need it with assault marines, but the plus one weapon skill on them is just so spicy. It also means you can really use the other Ultramarines um, Legacies unit, which is that super special assault squad. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce it because I can't think of it off the top of my head, uh, but essentially that is a better army to take that one, even going down the close combat approach. Um, so look, what else is there to the Ultramarines? They've got a bunch of war gear options, three, okay, not a bunch. Uh, they're all solid. The Legatine Axe in particular is amazing and you'll want to take it wherever you can ap2 at initiative is very rare in this edition so always worth it when you have the option their advanced reaction the, the ultramarines advanced reaction synergizes really nicely with their right of war it's shooting focused and essentially allows you to shoot two units at a target when uh, when firing back that making that reaction that means you get to shoot back at an opponent so having those longer range shooting units that we discussed those heavy sports squads allows you to pull it off quite reliably and effectively now their primarch the master of ultramar rebute gilliman is a great choice for larger points games and generally favors a close combat orientated army build if you're taking Rebute, uh, I'd throw out the balanced approach and definitely push that close combat potential of the Logos Lectora right of war. And that's how I'd approach building an Ultramarines Legion Force. The World Eaters. Brutality meets experimental brain implants. I actually really enjoy the tragedy of the World Eaters and the reasoning behind their self-induced descent into madness. Angron is such an interesting Primarch and his complex relationship with his Legion makes for some really cool army building opportunities. The 12th Legion essentially wants to do one thing. They want to close with their enemy and tear them apart with chain axes. As close combat armies go, they got, these guys give you a lot and a, are a great counter to some of the deep striking medalists that we're seeing out there. Blood Angels, Day of Revelations, I'm looking at you. So let's get into it. First up, the Age of Darkness box set. So the World Eaters get a lot out of the box set, uh, but do need a bit of help to reach their full potential. World Eaters are going to be an infantry-centric army, and the new Mark VI looks great with some 12th flavor added in. Honestly, 40 of them probably won't be enough, but there's plenty out there to be had uh, by second-hand deals and for bulk cheap. However, you don't want to give them bolters. You want chain axes. 
free chain axes for your world eaters as far as the eye can see. Just put them everywhere with some bolt pistols in the other hand. Now, big units of despoilers and assault squads are the smart choice, uh, but where do you get all these chain axes? Well, luckily for all the world eaters players out there, GW is soon to release a new box of corn berserkers. Also known as World Eaters plus 10,000 years. Now, that box of Berserkers is going to be absolute conversion gold for World Eaters players, and you should prepare yourself to buy at least a couple. I especially love all the bare heads with nails that are going to come in that set. It's just so tasty. Now, the scale should match up relatively nicely with the Mark VI out of the Heresy box set too, though would likely look ridiculously big on current Mark III and Mark IV. Alternatively, uh, there's also third-party bits or, or 3D printing options for getting your hands on bulk chain axes if you're looking for a budget way to get plus one strength and shred across almost your entire army. Just so nice. Moving on for the box set, you've got the 10 Cataphractite Terminators that will do just fine in a World Eaters army. Uh, plus one attack from their Legion rules becomes far more meaningful for close combat weapons that pack a punch. And there's nothing more punchier than a power fist. Well, except a thunder hammer, so... Take both in abundance across your army. Uh, with a bit of conversion work or some added 3D printed bits and pieces, you can also turn these guys into a big meaty unit of red butchers. I'd recommend to do this. Ah, and what are the red butchers' greatest weakness? Well, they're slow. So not being able to run is rather counterproductive to what the world eaters want to be doing. If you're going to turn these cataphracti into some red butchers, the Spartan that you're getting in the box set is just fantastic. Give this vehicle a flare shield and send them hurtling towards the enemy's toughest unit. Uh, you'll almost definitely come out on top. Except when you won't. Uh, which, okay, sometimes sometimes you won't against certain things. But they'll, they'll give a good show of themselves and that's what matters. Now, World Eaters Dreadnoughts are great. Uh, with two close combat weapons, because uh, long-ranged weapons are for the, the weaker legions, uh, you're getting six attacks on the charge. In a Dreadnought on Dreadnought Punch Fest, as long as you get the charge off, you're usually going to put the enemy Dread down in a single Assault phase. One Dread is great, two is better. Now, you don't have the option to give the box set Dread two close combat weapons, so you can either buy the close combat weapon set from GW, um, which is going to set you back half of what you can probably buy a second-hand Dread for, or you can once again turn to that handy 3D printer and just print yourself out of fist. If, you, if you're a gamer and you're putting armies together and you don't have a 3D printer, take a good long look at yourself. Uh, they just open up so many opportunities for army building and just give you so much flexibility with what you do. Now the Praetors in the box set aren't overly world eatery uh, and I'm super into Khan, but they can be converted to provide a number of useful consoles. Uh, Delegatas for smaller games, a Herald to give line to an obnoxious unit, or a chaplain to further boost your close combat prowess. Uh, once again, that corn Berserker box set is going to be absolutely snapped up by World Eaters players and will make those consoles or those Praetors look extra choppy and extra insane. Now, the box set is an obvious purchase for World Eaters players and with a bit of help from corn, third party bits or a 3D printer, it will give you the perfect starting army. Let's go on and have a look at the impact of the 12th's special rule. Now, it's nothing complicated. I've touched on it, uh, but just to clarify, the World Eaters get plus one attack when they charge, on top of their other bonuses, and even when it's a disorder charge. This is easily the best close combat themed Legion rule. It beats out other contenders like the Emperor's Champ Children, Emperor's Children, not Emperor's Champion, wrong army, uh, Emperor's Children and the Blood Angels. Uh, more attacks are always relevant in every single assault, uh, and World Eaters assault like nobody else. So what does this mean for army building? If you're taking a unit, it's because you either want it to get into assault, or it's going to enable you to get other units into combat. With less killing potential in the first and second turns, it also means you want to have some redu redundancy built into your army, as your opponent's firepower will have relatively free reign until you get your first charges off. For this reason, I would want to take a lot of line units in a World Eaters army, both the spoilers and assault squads, as already mentioned, are great choices. Their chain axes give them plus one strength and shredding combat, and if they're charging, they get plus two attacks. Big 20-man blobs with apothecaries are very powerful in a World Eaters army and can take on most targets. Veteran squads are another great choice because of their two base attacks and weapon skill of five. 
Also, they have some great options. Uh, just fire any miniature, any miniature in that, uh, any model in a veteran squad for five points can take a lightning claw or a power weapon. It's fantastic. It's just so good. Uh, Terminator squads are, of course, also really good in World Eaters armies, though I'd lean more towards the Tartarus uh, to take advantage of running and sweeping enemy units in combat. Cataphracti, a little bit slow for what you want to be doing here. Now, I've seen medium-sized units of jet bikes doing great work in World Eaters armies, able to get around or over an enemy's front line and into juicy heavy support squads or an armored gun line behind your enemy's front line. Your Sky Hunter squads come with chain swords, which means you get to upgrade them for free to chain axes, and a whole bunch of strength five attacks against the rear armor, armor of most non-land raider vehicles is gonna get the job done without exploding it and instant deathing your expensive jet bikes. Don't forget, your Sky Hunter squads can deep strike and can charge on the turn they do so. So that's a very viable option, especially when we're talking about assault squads in an army as well. Suddenly deep striking en masse becomes uh, a prospective tactic. Now transports are going to be important for certain squads in a World Eaters army. In particular, I wanna put the World Eaters Legion units into Land Raiders as they just aren't that survivable. Rampages, if not equipped with jump packs, which is definitely a viable option, I should say, would love a Land Raider to get around the table. Uh, their three plus save, two wounds, and toughness floor, toughness four has some native enemies out there, which can be avoided with a good assault vehicle. Uh, Scorpiuses, in particular, are gonna give them a really bad day. Uh, Red Butchers, as I noted before, really need a Spartan if you're taking a bigger squad and can conveniently take one as a dedicated transport. So you're probably going to do that. Finally, Contempt of Dreadnoughts, Two of them will make sure your army doesn't become bogged down by your opponent's own walking coffins while giving weight to your combats against enemy 2 plus save units, which your regular lads can struggle against. So there you have it. Infantry with close combat weapons, Terminators, Jet Bikes, Land Raiders, and Dreadnoughts. This will form the core of every World Eaters armies. Um, flavor the rest to spice. Some people like to put in some land speeders, maybe some javelins with some anti-take weapons in there to pop some transports so you can charge the meaty, meaty innards of your opponent. Um, but be aware, heavy support options, one of the rights of war gives you just a single choice. So you're gonna be pretty light on heavy support and, uh, and you might need to pay for a land raider for one of your units in there anyway. Although not the Legion special units, they have them as dedicated transports, which is nice. So, now that we understand what the World Eaters are all about, let's check out their Rites of War. There are two World Eater Rites of War, shockingly, both of them further the close combat theme. Uh, let's start with a Berserker Assault, which seems to be pretty popular. Now, it reads, effects. All units composed entirely of models with the Legionis Astartes World Eater Special Rule in a detachment using this Rite of War. I can probably just skip that part. Add plus two inches to the distance moved when running. Okay, uh, on top of that, they gain a bonus of plus two inches to all charge rolls made for them. Very nice. And they get a bonus of plus one to their leadership to a maximum of 10 when making pinning tests. Handy, there's a lot of pinning out there. Rampager squads may be taken as troops, sure. And Legion Predator squadrons may be taken as fast as tack. Slightly weird. Limitations. All units in a detachment using this right of war must declare a charge in any of the controlling player's assault phases where there is at least one model from an enemy unit within 12 inches in line of sight of a unit selected, etc., etc., um, Must always target the closest enemy unit if possible. Rough. Now an army that includes a detachment using this right of war can also not be included as an allied detachment. There's not much going on here that shapes the World Eaters army in a different direction. You could probably be more confident about a bulk deep strike assault with this right of war where that plus two to charge really comes in handy. The run bonus means you're generally leaving the Cataphracti Terminators and other heavy units at home unless they're in a Land Raider, but I feel like that was the plan anyway, so that's fine. Rampages as troops is nice as it opens up your elite slots, uh, but without line, I wouldn't be taking more than a single squad of them because, well, it's just, you need line units, right? And you've only got so many slots and, and points. Frustratingly, uh, and just to mock us, the Crimson Path Rite of War does give them line, but doesn't make them troops. Just seems rude. Predators as fast attack is kind of strange, as it's not like your heavy support slots are limited or filling up with this Rite of War, but 
it's something, I suppose, if that's what you're into. I'm not sure if I'm missing something there. If I am, please let me know. You would be very happy going Dreadnought Heavy in this list, it should be said. Uh, as a Dreadnought moving 14 inches a turn while running seems super obnoxious. Uh, and then getting plus three inches on the charge, it's just really good. Um, not that Dreadnoughts were slow, but giving them that extra move. I mean, they're killing things fine, they're surviving fine, and now they're just moving so fast in this army. So going Dreadnought heavy, uh, look, in any list is always a powerful option, but in this Rite of War, the Berserker Assault in particular seems pretty good. Now, it's a solid Rite of War that maybe gets you into Assault a turn earlier and has some inherent protection against pinning. So you can't be mad with that. Um, not crazy stuff about Legion building or army building here, but it's just, it's solid and it does world eater things. Now, next up, as I mentioned, is the Crimson Path Rite of War. This one does have a few build considerations, uh, but let's have a look at the Rite of War before we dive on in. The effects. Any unit composed entirely of models with both the infantry unit type and, yep, blah, 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 ignore the first wound inflicted on that unit in each phase. No saves or damage mitigation rolls are made for this wound. It is simply discarded and no other special rules may be triggered because of that. That's really nice, not only for ignoring kind of those big instant death wounds if they're coming in, but pinning wounds. Um, lots of people like to have small units of... Um, what am I looking for here? Recon Marines or Scouts with those Nemesis Bolters and kind of trying to spread pinning around your army. And they're particularly going to want to do that to the World Eaters because you want to get up the board and you want to get into Assault, often with big meaty units that are walking on foot. So being able to discard that wound, if they only do a single wound, for instance, from a small Recon Squad with pinning, means you don't have to take the pinning test. That's really nice. I just noticed that. Uh, other effects, all models with both an independent character and a, <laughs> yep, an attachment using this right of war, yep, gain the it will not die five plus special rule while outside of their own deployment zone. This does not stack with their versions of the it will not die special rule, other versions, and the controlling player must select one version of the rule to use. Sure. Rampage squads in a detachment using this right of war, as I said before, gain the line unit subtype. Line is good. Limitations, uh, detachments, blah, 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 uh, must have total number of units that include one or more models. You need more infantry, is what this says. You need more infantry units than you have combined of all other unit types. So you can't have a whole bunch of dreadnoughts and only two infantry squads, that doesn't work. And a detachment using this right of war may include only a single heavy support choice. There's that limitation, we all saw it coming. So what do we want to do here? The first thing I want to do is create a Red Butcher Death Star. Big unit of Red Butchers, a Primus Medicae, and I think maybe a Herald in Cataphracti Terminator armor, obviously with the Berserker upgrades for the, uh, for the two characters. This unit has Feel No Pain, two characters with It Will Not Die, who then get to re-roll that five plus each turn to get a wound back, and it ignores the first wound it cops each phase. Noting that's in your opponent's turn as well. So reactions, uh, you're going to be ignoring a wound from all the reactions coming in as well, which is really nice. Now the units also got line from the Herald. It's handing out a leadership bonus to everyone around them. It's got fear one. It's just a really cool unit that's doing lots of things. Add a Spartan and you've got an absolute wrecking ball that can take some hits in return, get up the table and take on your opponent's toughest unit. So Red Butcher Death Star, point one. Next, Rampage of Squads getting line, super tasty. Because uh, you've got a bit of protection from the Rite of War. I'd happily take them in a 10-man squad with jump packs, which you'd be a bit hesitant to do otherwise, perhaps. I'd support this with a couple of assault squads, uh, and you're going to be putting a lot of pressure on your opponent really early on with, you know, 50, maybe, Marines jump packing up the table. That just seems really good. Seems really cool. Uh, I'd also then look at a second Rampager squad on the Land Raider, because that's where I want to put Khan. And I want to take Khan, because Khan is great. So he wants to go with some uh, some Rampagers, because he can't go with the Red Butchers. So putting him with Rampagers is probably the way to go. Uh, Khan just seems like so much fun, and the added protection he gives to your Rampagers against charge reactions is really significant. Uh, I won't go into it, read his rules if you're interested. That's his Warlord trait. Now, having two Land Raiders in an army filled with close combat death is also really nice as it creates some hard decision points for your opponents, anti-armor units. Always go to. Dreadnoughts and jet bikes are certainly still handy in this Rhino War, but they're not infantry, so they don't get the Crimson Path benefits. 
To deal with enemy dreadnoughts and tanks, it might be worth looking instead at a deep strike and destroyer squad armed with melter bombs. Um, I really like destroyer squads being able to take a whole lot of melter bombs in them, even though they're just weapon skill four. If you get two or three melter bombs slapped onto a dreadnought, um, you're gonna be giving it a pretty hard time in combat, which is what we're looking for here. Both world leaders, rights of wars are very viable, both Berserker Assault and the Crimson Path, and give you mildly different army building considerations. I myself would lean more towards the Crimson Path as the mandatory charges required by Berserker Assault could be so crippling <laughs> for a clever opponent is both able to and smart enough to take advantage of it. When it comes to Warlord traits, special characters and their armory, there's nothing overly impactful on army building from the World Eaters. Uh, their Warlord traits are fine, but nothing special. Blood Hunter is probably winning out as long as you can keep your Warlord away from instant death weapons, whereas the other two have some, some pretty significant limitations. Uh, I think Khan and his Warlord trait to deny charge reactions, which I mentioned before, against his unit is just much better than the, yeah, than the basic Warlord traits. So if I'm going to be taking a Master of the Legion and I have the points spare, I'm taking Khan. He seems great. Angron is a beat stick, as we would expect, but does nothing to your army build choices besides finding him a unit to be accompanied by. Uh, if you have to make that decision, I'd probably go Rampages over Red Butchers, just so you can spread around that hatred bonus and take advantage of Chosen Warriors. You don't want to get Khan, although he can make multiple challenges, it should say, but having him just fight a single sergeant when you charge into a unit seems like a waste. The biggest impact of the World Eaters Armory options, the Berserker upgrade, and the ability to take Chain Axes, we've already talked about. And besides some very interesting weapon options for the Rampages, which it should be noted can be taken by characters, including your unit sergeants, uh, there's nothing more to talk about here when it comes to army building. 